Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. This is the podcast that everyone is talking about, and tonight is going to be one of those discussions everyone's going to be talking about. We are going to be discussing the millennium, and we are all, I'm messing up the audio already, we are going to be having this discussion with uh, three different men that hold three different positions. I am premillennial. Uh, Brother Clem is amillennial, and Pastor Tyler Baker is uh, postmillennial. And so we're going to describe what those mean, and I think this is going to be a interesting, productive con- conversation. Hopefully it will not be a dumpster fire. And the Spirit of Prophecy podcast, it is, we're a podcast that confuses everyone because of the fact that I am an IFB pastor, but I do what most do and do not do, and that is I accurately represent other positions. And I'm also not afraid to be challenged by my own. I will admit there are positions where we are weak, and I will, sh- but I will also show our arguments are strong. And my goal is always to have an honest pursuit of the truth. This program does not carry water for any group or any specific doctrine. We engage in productive conversations that most are afraid to have, and I'm regularly repulsed and disgusted by those that are incapable of accurately representing other positions. I am horrified by those who with great boldness will proclaim publicly that someone is a heretic, but they will not allow themselves to be publicly challenged or will not publicly engage with those they publicly call out in their echo chambers. I have no respect for those who can't keep a conversation on topic. And when someone disagrees with them on something, they, you know, like the millennium, instead of addressing their argument, illustrating where they're wrong, they'll just accuse them of Calvinism or being Catholic or something along those lines. This is the way most people handle disagreements, but it is meaningless, pointless, and frankly, just lame. And tonight, hopefully we will not be like that. Hopefully we'll have a meaningful and educating conversation. And if we do, once again, we will find out why everyone is talking about the Spirit of Prophecy podcast. And so we do want to have some honesty and integrity. And that's why, too, you know, when I have guests on this show, I have people who I disagree with all the time, uh, some people who I disagree with and I respect, some people I disagree with and disrespect. I've had full-blown Orthodox Jews on here. I've had uh, Calvinists on this program. I've had all different types of people on this program. But at the same time, these are people, too, who uh, I feel act fairly and uh, treat the other side fairly. People who just want to uh, get attention, call names, uh, engage in dumpster fires. Uh, I'm just, I'm absolutely not interested in that at all. And uh, and these men, I feel like they have conducted themselves well. Uh, I've listened to some of their uh, teaching they've done on these things. And I don't sense any of that nonsense from them. And I felt like we could have uh, the kind of conversation I think people uh, will want to hear, uh, want to listen to, because frankly, there is more that we don't know about the millennium than what we do know about the millennium. And so let's see if we can't succeed in having a good, productive conversation. And so we're going to start out uh, just with uh, have you guys introduce yourself. So, Brother Clem, you've been on the show many times. Go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about you. Yeah, thank you, Pastor McMurtry. It's good to be here and uh, this is i'm looking forward to this i think this is going to be good my name is scott clem i live in the northeast corner of wyoming uh, pastor a small uh, house church at the moment and uh, uh other than that um married have five kids the oldest just graduated this last year and uh yeah uh i don't know if there's much else really to add um this is uh other than yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I thought it'd be good. All right, yeah, and then now, and we also have Pastor Tyler Baker, first time ever on the program. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. Hey, man, all right. I appreciate uh, having me on it, just as uh, Brother Scott said as well, and uh, honored to be on here. And I watch your podcast and have uh, enjoyed the way you've conducted yourself. And that's one thing in particular that. I have respected and appreciated, so I'll throw that out there to begin. But my name is Tyler Baker. I'm a pastor here in Jacksonville, Florida, and I pastor Valiant Baptist Church, and uh, we are an independent Baptist church here in Jacksonville. I have seven kids, 
and uh, have been married for going on 12 years. Uh, hopefully my wife is not watching this right now. I saw that hesitation. Um, but uh, yeah, that's about it. Awesome. All right. So what we're going to do to kick this program off tonight and um, and remember uh, there are going to be there is going to be a time for questions uh, later on in the program. So make sure if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. If they are directed uh, towards any specific individual, uh, mention who that is so we can ask them that question. So the way we're going to do this is I'm going to uh, uh, right now we're briefly going to explain what we believe about the millennium and and then after we've done that what we're going to do is we're going to take turns challenging i guess giving the best challenges that we feel uh we have towards the other position and so um the way we kind of have it on the intro picture we got pre-millennial amillennial and post-millennial we'll kind of go in that order and uh but uh as far as and how we introduce these things challenge them and see if we can uh, learn anything from each other because I will be the first to admit there's still much I don't understand about the other positions. And while I hear a lot of people that are always quick to just label something a heresy, okay, there's such a thing as heresy, but why is that heresy? And so I've heard many premillennial people say amillennialists and postmillennialists are heretics. Well, we'll find out tonight. Let's see. Uh, I, I've been trying to think of a good reason why that is heresy. Um, but, uh, I, I, I don't know that I would, I don't know that I can say that, uh, in all honesty, I, I will say that about things like full preterism, but, uh, I feel like these guys still fit in the category of people who believe in a future return of Christ and a resurrection of the dead. And I've just, that's kind of where I've drawn the line when it comes to, um, I'll, I'll call you a heretic after you deny those things. But other than that, I think we can disagree. So anyway, just briefly, when it comes to the millennium, uh, I am premillennial. I did a program recently on it. Um, I I claimed on there uh, one of the main reasons I'm premillennial. It's all I've ever known. It's tradition. It's how I've been raised. But at the same time, too, I do believe that the uh, Bible teaches a, liter a literal thousand-year period. And what I, I believe, and if you're not familiar with the definition of premillennial, it means that Jesus Christ is going to return to earth before that thousand year kingdom. And so I believe that Jesus Christ is going to return after the tribulation, but before he pours his wrath out and he is going to uh, eventually come on this earth, step foot on that Mount of Olives. I still believe that in Jerusalem, I believe he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem and he is going to uh, do that for a thousand years. I believe at that point there will have been the resurrection of the dead. We'll have our glorified bodies. And I believe we're going to rule on reign and rule and reign on earth with Christ for a thousand years. Uh, after the thousand years, I believe that Satan is going to be loosed from the pit for a little season. And he is going to go and deceive the nations of the world once again. And there is going to be that final Gog and Magog battle that, of course, will end with Jesus winning. And then uh, we will go into a new heaven and new earth. I believe at that after that. We'll have the great white throne of judgment. And then um, once death and hell have been cast in the lake of fire and God has wiped all tears away from our eyes, yeah, we, do, we go in the new heaven and new earth. Uh, God himself is going to dwell with us on this earth. And I believe we are going to be on earth for all eternity, but a perfect earth unlike this one. And I believe that is the premillennial uh, view. And as the program goes, we'll get into some of the more scriptural reasons on that. But uh, hopefully that's a good explanation of premillennial. Where I guess I might be different than a lot of premillennialists is most premillennialists are typically dispensational in their theology. Uh, I reject dispensationalism. And um, they also believe uh, most of their reason for the millennium. And I'm sure we'll get into that at some point. It's kind of centered around Israel. And I obviously do not do that either. I think there's a lot of foolishness and maybe even heresy being taught uh, about another temple that's going to come in the millennium where there will be sacrifices. I don't know if I'm totally prepared to call someone a heretic for believing that, but I am I am not pleased when I hear that at all. I think that's Let's really bad it. teaching. And um, but anyway, that's that's enough for me on that. 
Brother Clem, tell us what amillennialism is. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, let me just um, begin by saying that um, I grew up under uh, really a classic dispensationalist kind of a framework. Um, for those who know what that is, there's different forms of dispensationalism, classic, reformed, progressive. So I was more of kind of the uh, the uh, the Darby and, and Schofield school of things. Uh, I grew up under the impression that uh, Jesus came during his first ministry, that he offered the kingdom to the Jews, uh, that as a, as a result of the Jews rejecting the kingdom, that God hit the pause button. He postponed the kingdom. It's put in abeyance. And instead, uh, what, was, what came about was this parenthetical period uh, known as the church age uh, that dispensationalists finally call a mystery, that it was something that was not foreseen or anything like that. Uh, and then essentially during the church age, God replaces Israel with the church and then when jesus comes again well i, I held first of all to the preacher rapture type of, of stuff so jesus would rapture his church away um and then he would replace essentially the church with israel once again and resume his kingdom program and that would go on for a thousand years so that's and that's not that's not the dispensator that's not the premillennialism uh, that pastor mcmurtry just espoused uh, but that's that's what i held to so that's that was that's my background that's where i came from I moved from dispensational premillennialism to more of a historic premillennialism uh, to then really kind of moving into the area of of amillennialism or, or postmillennialism. I don't though I, I I can't say that I'm I, I fit the the clear cut category of amillennialism. Amillennialism. I'll uh, explain that here in just a moment. Uh, but one of the things that you know I think that we can all agree on. Um, as far as the concept anyway, is that there is there is going to be an imperfect kingdom, an imperfect reign of Christ, where there's going to, still going to be sin and death and rebellion and all that kind of stuff here on the earth. It's going to be an imperfect kingdom. Not that Jesus is imperfect by any means. Of course, he's perfect. We know that. Um, but as far as the conditions here on earth. And then one day in the future, we might call it eternity future, that there's going to be a a perfected kingdom, a kingdom where there's going to be no more, you know, crying or sin or death or marriage or childbirth or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and and as, as I agree with um, with Tommy that it's going to be here on a renewed earth. All right, eternity is not going to be in a disembodied heaven where we're floating around playing harps, uh, but rather we're going to be resurrected, physically resurrected, in glorified bodies here on a renewed earth, and that's going to be the that's what's going to take place forever and ever and ever. The the, the issue is, is and, and I, like I said, I think we all can agree on, on those concepts. It's a matter of um, the different terms and the timing, I think, where we would probably disagree with some of these other things. Amillennialism is, is actually pretty simple. Um, amillennialism and postmillennialism, and I'm not going to speak for Tyler. He can explain this here in just a moment. Um, but both amillennialism and postmillennialism believe that Jesus returns after the millennium. So premillennialism, Jesus returns first, sets up his kingdom, goes on for a thousand years. And then we get to the perfected kingdom after that, great, uh, great white throne judgment, so on and so forth. Amillennialism and postmillennialism both believe that when, when the second coming happens, that's it. That's the, your, there's final judgment. And then we go straight into the perfected kingdom. So that that would um, you know. So what about the millennial period? That that's the big question. Amillennialism does not believe that there is no millennium, but rather that the the millennium is being realized right now. Or you, we might uh, what I would I, you know, the term that I like to use is an an inaugurated kingdom, and I think that's what's going on right now. So for amillennialism, it believes that from uh, the the inner advent period, from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. That that entire period would be the millennial reign. Um, it takes a thousand years as being more figur figurative. Obviously, it's been more than a, than a thousand years. Um, the difference between amillennialism and postmillennialism is is amillennialism traditionally has believed that the millennial reign is is in heaven. Now we know that that Jesus rules and reigns in heaven right now. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He has all power in heaven 
and earth. So he's king. He, he rules. He reigns. And we can rightly say that, that he is reigning from heaven. Amillennialism believes that you die, you go to heaven, you rule and reign with Christ, and that the millennial reign is characterized more spiritually in heaven. I, I tend to reject that, the kind of classic view, because I don't believe that the millennial... the um you know that we are in the age to come uh i i don't believe um you know we're, we're going to get into some of those things and i want to hear how tyler kind of defines some of these things as well but that's pro probably where my disagreement is going to be with with um with post-millennialism more than anything else but amillennialism in a nutshell is things from the first advent to the second advent go on this is the this is the messianic era this is the messianic reign that's taking place right now and that when Jesus comes again, that's it. We we go straight into the resurrection, the final judgment. The wicked are removed from the earth. They're cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. And the perfected kingdom is established here on earth. And so uh, with that, hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that definitely makes sense. And so before, Pastor Baker, you get into your um, your position on this. I, one thing I wanted to make sure I understand, I was interested in seeing if you guys would both agree with this, but I guess the difference between amillennialism and postmillennialism is in the postmillennialist, you also believe that the kingdom is right now and that once we have kind of succeeded in Christianizing the world, then Christ will come back and we'll go into the perfected kingdom. Mm -hmm. We're in the amillennial position, um, I know when I interviewed Pastor Foskey a while back, he believed there could be a coming tribulation, Antichrist, all that kind of stuff. Um, but is it is it more about how things are going to end? Like the postmillennial has more of an optimistic view, the amillennialist a pessimistic view. That's the main difference is optimism and pessimism. Yeah, I was going to kind of touch on um, some of the variations within postmillennialism, even, and I may have. I don't, I don't know if it's considered a minority, you know, view when it comes to the the uh, ending um, of the, the consummation of the uh, interadvental period that we're in now. But I could share that in just a minute, and that'll that'll be a perfect application to it if you if you'd like. OK, but yeah, if you want. Yeah. So I, I that was just something I was wanting to make sure I was right on. But yeah, go ahead. And uh, and then if you want to just um, yeah, whatever you want to yeah. cover on that and explain your position. Yeah, I think when it's in context, it might make a little bit more yeah. sense. But um, so, yeah, just kind of a quick summary. And like Pastor McMurtry mentioned, I'm not going to necessarily give too many scriptural supports for it right now, but I'll just kind of give a summary of what um, postmillennialism is generally, uh, but in particular, my brand, if you will, of postmillennialism. So the really, the, if, you're, if you're wanting to understand what postmillennialism is, there's really two fundamental distinctives of postmillennialism. And first is the timing of Christ's return. And this is what would distinguish postmillennialism from premillennialism. Um, here, what we're going to see, th there's going to be a similarity. This will be an agreement with amillennialism. That is, postmillennialism and amillennial amillennialism both teach and believe that, that Christ's second coming is after the millennial reign. However, there's a little bit of a difference in how we understand the millennial reign. And I can touch on that too, but Amil and Postmill both are by definition partial preterist positions, which is just to say that parts of what's considered eschatology have been fulfilled. Albeit the things that are in the future, as Pastor McMur McMurtry pointed out, would be Christ's physical coming, the resurrection of the just and the unjust, that is the resurrection of the dead, final judgment, the restoration of all things, and then following that, the eschaton and, and um Brother uh, Clem also touched on a lot of these different things um, as well. So all of those things would still be future. Um, but uh, what this would mean is that Christ's return is after 
the millennial reign, which would entail a few things with that, and that is that Christ is reigning now. Christ reigns during the inter-advental period, and it's called the inter-advental period because we have Christ's first coming, or his first advent. Then in between his first coming and second coming, we have the reign of Christ. So the Bible teaches that Christ is reign is reigning now. Following the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus, the Bible teaches, had all power and authority. Uh, the Bible teaches that he ascended to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and he was set above all principalities and powers uh, in this world, uh, but also in the world to come. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And at that time, the Bible also says that he is seated in David's throne, which would be uh, in, in heaven, New Jerusalem, at the right hand of the Father. So we would say that this is the reign of of Christ, and furthermore, that it's been inaugurated, but not yet fully consummated. And this is uh, the the timing of this is really what's going to distinguish um, pre mill and post millennialism. And that is that we have the reign of Christ now, and Christ will return following His reign. So He reigns he, when Christ is reigning. He's going to do so from heaven, from the right hand of the Father, and then He comes back. So that is by definition. In, and I would look at 1 Corinthians 15 for this, that would be the end of the millennial reign of Christ. When Christ returns, what we have is, at Christ's return, the resurrection, and that is a general resurrection, a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And then furthermore, at that very same time, is the general judgment. This is what we would think of as the great white throne judgment. It would be a judgment of the just and the unjust. And then, as I said, we would then enter into the eschaton. You have the restoration of all things. And, and I agree with uh, Pastor McMurtry that we would live on earth for eternity going forward. The second distinctive of postmillennialism, as uh, Pastor McMurtry pointed out, is the optimism. And namely, what that is, is the optimism for the future of human history. All, all of us are going to have eventual or ultimate optimism of the eschaton, the eternal state, the restoration of all things. But it would be optimism for the future of human history. And this is really where, and you touched on it just a moment ago, where we're going to see a distinction between ah-mill and post-mill. Um, all millennialism is typically not as optimistic, although there are some that hold to an optimistic view of all millennialism. But uh, the post-millennial view would say with the kingdom of God coming, Christ now reigning, those things have occurred. He is king and Lord over all things in heaven and earth. And with that, that includes the nations. He has power over all nations, over all heaven and earth, and that would be all nations. And his authority has consequences. It's not like merely ethereal. So when he was given all power and authority, he declares that to his apostles. The consequence is go forth and preach the gospel into all nations. And I believe that this is the fulfillment of much of the book of Isaiah, where the nations are converted. Uh, the passages in the Psalms that would talk about the Messiah reigning, and he reigns over the nations, and the nations are converted. So this would be, as I alluded to earlier, um, Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's reigning. That is him being you know, um, being given all power and authority. That is him seated at the right hand of the Father with all power and authority. And furthermore, what, the most quoted passage from the Old Testament is Psalm 110, and uh, verse 1, um, I believe it's verse 1, and it is, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So I think this is something that's missed oftentimes, and that is that Christ while his enemies are made his footstool, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. I believe that's the time period, the inter-advental period that we are in now, and there's optimism for this. We have the inauguration of the kingdom, and the kingdom grows. And lastly, I would point to, for this optimism, as uh, just one example, in uh, Daniel 2, we have the vision of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue, and the, 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 the stone is cut out of a mountain. The stone falls to the earth. I believe that's the kingdom of God coming to the earth. It smites the feet of the image, and it smashes the entire image. It breaks apart, and it just blows away into pieces. And from that point, it says that it's a small stone when it falls. It, it's implying that a stone is small, but it says that it grows from that point into a great mountain. And I believe that that, again, is the period of where the nations are being converted. The gospel is going out into all nations. That's while Christ is reigning now, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And during that time, his enemies are made his footstool. So there would be a little bit of, not a little bit, a big difference 
in how we viewed the millennial reign as far as um, you know physical and spiritual when it comes to to Christ's reign. But there are, and this is the qualifications, I'll, I'll touch this real quickly, and this is kind of the difference that I was referring to a minute ago. Um, as far as the nations being converted, there are some post-millennialists, not many at all. And you can look this up on Wikipedia, but there are some that would have a top-down approach, like get into government and things like that. The vast majority of post-millennialists, and this is the position that I would hold, would be that there's a bottom-up approach. And that is that the way that that the world is Christianized, as you referred to it, is is beginning with the church house. Christians go out into the world as Christ commanded his disciples, and men are conv- converted, their hearts are converted, their families are transformed, society is therefore transformed. It's a slow process. It's a stone, and then it grows into a great mountain. So there, there's difference in the top and bottom down approach. So I take a bottom, or I'm sorry, a top down or a bottom up approach, and I take, take a bottom up approach. And then secondly, there's a spectrum on what the end product looks like. How, how what does it look like for the nations to be converted? Right. And that's that's kind of um, that can be a little hazy because, uh, you know, Scripture isn't specific about that to begin in whatever you know uh, view we take. And then thirdly, and this kind of gets to third. Uh, this right here touches on what you were uh, mentioning there a moment ago. Um, some believe that there's a, a, a sort of apostasy that occurs at the very end of the interadvental period, the reign of Christ. And I believe that personally. I believe that there will be an apostasy, and I believe that's what Revelation 20 is teaching, albeit in symbols and things, but that there will be an apostasy at the end of, uh, for a lack of a better word, the age that we're in, the interadvental period, that this time period of the messianic era, as Brother Scott referred to it as. I think there'll be an apostasy. I think that all eras or, or ages, if you will, have ended in apostasy, and I think that that will happen to some degree. I believe the Bible teaches in this uh, age as well. Whereas some postmillennialists teach that there will be a literal thousand years at the end of this messianic era, that is the golden age, where we see some things more literally fulfilled um, at that ending period. So I hope that wasn't too long, but that would be my summary of postmillennialism with some qualifications. Okay. No, that was interesting too, because it kind of answered, you know, some of my objections that I had too. Um, I didn't know that you believed in the potential apostasy uh, that could come at the end, which, you know, seems likely. But I think before we kind of get into challenging these things, something I feel like we probably need to do just because I'm, I'm going to assume most of my audience is probably premillennial because, um, you know, that's what I am and what most people are on the Baptist world anyway. So um, when I've listened to, you know, I listen to your guys' podcast, you know, Brother Clem, I've listened to some of your teaching on this. And while I, um, one thing you don't hear very much from the premillennial crowd is talk about the kingdom. And, you know, Brother Clem, I've heard you, I hear you talk a lot about the kingdom. Um, I've, and, and when I listen to what you're teaching on the kingdom, I'm like, well, I mean, a lot of this stuff is basically irrefutable. It's like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, this is now. Uh, no doubt about that, but is it is there any reason why, um, you know, we can't that we're you know, we can be in the kingdom right now and it's a spiritual kingdom, but at the same time too, we are waiting for the physical manifestation of it as of as well. So, what you're teaching about the kingdom as an amillennialist, it's true now, but the premillennialist could they still also be right that there will be a physical fulfilling like with salvation we're saved right now but we're still waiting for the redemption of our body so i guess when i'm listening to most of what most of what you say i'm like i feel like that can be true too but along with what we teach is there any reason why there wouldn't be that millennial that physical kingdom i guess well i would i would be in an agreement that there is going to be a physical kingdom here on this earth. Mm-hmm. The, the difference between the premillennialists and the amillennialists or postmillennialists is that we we believe that, that that kingdom here on the earth is going to be the perfected kingdom. Mm-hmm. In other words, when, uh, so, so and, I, and I appreciate you bringing this up as far as the kingdom of God. In fact, this was one of the things that I really, really wrestled with. Because I had it ingrained in my head that Jesus came and he offered the kingdom and the Jews rejected it. And so God hit the pause button. It's put in abeyance. 
Um, and I really had to wrestle with that because as, as I look through scripture, I mean, and one, one of the things that I just kind of did on my own is, you know, just take a uh, concordance. I looked up kingdom and I, I tracked every single reference to kingdom in the New Testament. And I was kind of shocked. In fact, I've, I've got a I've got a PDF uh, or a Word document where I have all of those verses, every single one that's listed on there. In fact, I got it printed out and it's sitting right next to me. It's pages long and it's amazing how you see that all throughout the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was preaching the kingdom of God. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, this is a main emphasis of Jesus' own ministry is the, is the kingdom of God. The Old Testament uh, talks about the kingdom of God. They, they were they were waiting for the Messiah to usher in this kingdom. So it was no surprise um, when Jesus comes on scene and he says, you know, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So so all, those are all of those kind of things that I wrestled with. And so, um, you know, kind of just answer your, your question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not wrong for the premillennialists. And this is one of the, the accusations that I get. Um, from some premillennialists. They say, well, you don't believe in a physical kingdom. Well, yeah, I do believe in a physical kingdom. I just believe that when Jesus Christ comes, that it's not going to be a, a, an extra thousand years of imperfected kingdom where you have some resurrected saints and some st sinners still on the earth, and you've got this mixed thing going on for you know an, an unperfected state for an, an extra 1,000 years. I believe the, the, the imperfect kingdom is, is happening right now. Um, right now, the gospel is going to the nations. Right now, there's still Satan, sin, and death. Right now, there's still war. Right now, people still reject Christ. Um, and all of those things are, are characteristic of what we would call the millennial reign. So, um, so yes, the premillennialists and amillennialists and the postmillennialists post all agree that there is going to be a perf there's going to be a kingdom here on this earth, a physical concrete kingdom here on this earth the okay. difference is, is we believe that's going to be per the perfected kingdom whereas premillennialism believes you're going to have a thousand years of of the imperfected kingdom going on and then finally the perfected kingdom going on after that so right well and and it's see it's listening to stuff like this where i'm like okay that's why as premillennialists we've got to explain and i'm not hearing good explanations i think i might have some of, I guess, you know, what the purpose of the kingdom is now and what is the need for the thousand year one that's still imperfect, you know, you know, unperfected after that. And, you know, those are super legitimate questions that I feel like are not even being discussed in the premillennial world. And that's why, even if I still disagree, I, I have a tough time getting upset because I'm not even real satisfied with you know, my explanation, and, I'm, and we'll, hopefully we'll have time to get into that. But, you know, Pastor Baker, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Is there any reason why it can't be both, that we have the spiritual, It's but it's spiritual now, but it's going to be physical in the future, but for the thousand years? <clears throat> to be honest, I agreed with, with literally everything that Brother Scott just said. So I, okay. I would view it identically to how he explained it. So I, I believe that it will be physical in that sense, the same way that Brother Scott described it, except when it's physical, it's perfected at the bodily coming of Christ is a way to, you know, to, another way to kind of word it. So uh, I would say, and, and that's actually would, would be, you know, um, I don't know if that's where we're headed, but that would be one of my disagreements with the pre-mill position as well, because it feels like there's superfluous things that are, that are added with the pre-mill position. Like it's just kind of unnecessary. And then there's this additional period of time when we can see application in scripture to the time period in between Christ's first coming and second coming for the reign of Christ. It feels like it's, it's just, it's, it's eisegesis and, and it's just, it's just hanging out there with no support to uh, apply another time period. And that's mm. essentially what brother Scott was referring to. Okay. So I think another thing too, that it's important that we address, you know, before we get into the objections too, just again, for my audience and, and for myself too. So um, when it comes to prophecy and what is still to come, um, you know, what, you know, brother Clem as an amillennialist, what do you believe is still to come? And the way I always like to illustrate it in Clarence Larkin's charts, you know, with his seals, trumpets, and vials. 
Okay, and obviously in the post-trib world, we put the rapture in a different spot, but pretty much across the premillennial world, we would all be in agreement on what events are future, you know, and before the millennium. So uh, what events do you think are still to come that you're watching for? Yeah, so um, just kind of hit on maybe that difference between uh, post-millennialism and amillennialism. Amillennialism tends to be a little more pessimistic. Um, I, I would agree. I would agree um, with with Tyler that um, there is a sense in which the the gospel is going to succeed. Um, Jesus said that you know he will build his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you get this image of of the church that's marching against the gates of hell. Gates are a defensive mechanism. So the gates aren't going to hold, you know, they're not going to hold the church, not going to hold the kingdom back. So I agree with that. But I, I believe that the kingdom is is built through suffering. Um, you know, it's it's the blood of the saints is, is um, you know, as they say, is the, the seed of the church or however that phrase goes. Um and so I think there's going to be an immense amount of suffering. There's going to be tribulation. In fact, you know, it's mentioned in what is it, Acts 14, 22. You know, um, you know, we through much tribulation do enter the kingdom of God or something along along those lines. Jesus says you're going to have tribulation in this year, in this world. Um, I take the, the 70 weeks of Daniel, uh, that prophecy, I believe that is messianic and not eschatological. Uh, in other words, I don't believe that refers to a future. I don't think there's going to be a future 70th week. Um, now, I think we see illusions of that in Revelation. I think we see illusions of a lot of past prophecies that have already been fulfilled that are inserted into Revelation. I think Revelation, um, John uses uh, under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit at Jesus's direction uses a lot of Old Testament symbols of things that have already happened in the past, but he's using it to describe what's going to happen in the future. Um, and so I, I would still say that, yeah, is, is there, um, and this is where you're going to find some disagreement. Again, I guess on millennialism and post-millennialism, how much of Revelation is, um, is, is, is actually left to be fulfilled. Um, many post-millennialists, um, I think they take a stronger um, partial preterist stance um, in that they be believe a lot of revelation is actually speaking to what happened in 70 AD. And I can see it from that, from that point of view, me personally, um, I am not, I am not as dogmatic when it comes to things in revelation and I can go into all that stuff later on. Um, but I'm, I'm very open to what could happen in the future. I still believe that there's going to be, a uh, future tribulation, probably an intense period of tribulation. Uh, I think that there's going to be um, an, an antichrist type system. Um, now, many people talk about the beast, you know, speaking um, in, in Revelation, you know, talking about a particular man that's going to be the antichrist. One of the things, though, that I keep, and I'm not, I don't discount that. But the thing to realize is the, the image of beast that's taken again from Daniel and beasts represent governments. Um, and so, uh, you know, as far as an antichrist system, I guess I'm more open to the idea that, um, you know, every nation is ruled by somebody. Right. But um, but I think the emphasis is more on the nation than it is a particular man. Um, I typically don't think that there is going to be a future temple uh, rebuilt in Jerusalem. You know, you got that situation. The temple is going to be rebuilt by the Antichrist. He's going to go in there, you know, three and a half years and break the covenant that he makes and all that kind of stuff. I tend to think that's not going to happen. And for a scriptural reason, um, in, in Luke 21, uh, Jesus said that the um, the, the temple in, in the city, I'm, I'm butchering the verse, um, but it's going to be um, it's going to be overrun until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I'll have to find that verse. The, but the point is, is it's, you know, who controls the Temple Mount still today? Well, it's, it's Gentiles. Israel doesn't control that. And so, um, you know, when is the time of the Gentiles fulfilled? Well, it's fulfilled at the second coming. So I, I, I personally don't think that there's going to be a temple that is going to be built. Um, I could be wrong. I'm open to the fact that I could be wrong. If, if there's a temple, then, then great. Um, so... So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, you know, when I look at Revelation, I'm not as dogmatic on certain things, pretty open to how situations can play out. But but where I if I'm anything, 
I am very, um, uh, what's the word? Um, very cautious. And if, if I do anything, it's probably to urge people to, to exercise some caution and that, you know, don't, don't marry, you know, don't marry yourself to a particular end times view. Um, be, be careful on which hills you're going to die on. Uh, don't, don't say that this is going to be how it is. And the rest of you are heretics. If you don't believe it my way, when, when you're not a prophet and you really don't know how things exactly are going to play out. Um, so, so I, I think that things are going to get bad. Um, I think they're going to get continually worse. At the same time, I think that by, by suffering, the kingdom, uh, is going to be built. And so in, in that way, I'm kind of, you know, uh, optimistic as far as um, post-millennialism is, is concerned. I think that the kingdom is going to grow and it's, it has grown and it's going to be successful. But I believe that comes at a cost and that is it's it's suffering because that's how Jesus that's how Jesus built the kingdom. That's how Jesus overcame. He overcame not by killing people, but by suffering. And his body is, is going to do the same thing. So. OK, yeah. So. Pastor Baker, same thing for you. Um, I, you know, I heard you say the other day that you know you used to be post-trib, pre-wrath. So with this post-millennial view, how does that kind of change other future events? You know that we would typically associate with uh, the tribulation and all that. Yeah. So um, yeah, Brother Scott was exactly correct in another difference uh, between amill and postmill, and that is that I would take some passages. We, we would we would hold to essentially a very similar timeline uh, that is an amill and postmill adherent, whether that be Scott and I or wh whomever. Um, but we may have different applications. And for example, as he pointed out, I would probably uh, believe hold a stronger position that uh, the. Uh, more of the events of the book of Revelation applied to 70 AD. Now, he, he would also say, hey, you know, I believe this is 70 AD. We would all point to Matthew 24 and Daniel's 70th week. But um, uh, it sounds like that I would say that more of the events of the book of Revelation were 70 AD. 70 AD. Now, of course, as I mentioned in my summary of post-millennialism, um, I also would believe in a bodily, physical second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at that point the the uh, you know the quick and the dead are raised and judged an official judgment and then we will also see the restoration of all things and then the eschaton will step into the eternal state where all things are perfected and live in God's kingdom forever eternally um I'm, you know there's a, there's a lot of things that Brother Scott just said, though, that I would still agree with, even as a post-millennialist, and that is that I still believe the principle of just general principle of Christianity is that through suffering, the kingdom grows. And I think that that's still the case even today, um, that you know the way up is down, right? And uh, the way to get to the front of the line is to go to the back of the line. If you want to be first, got to be last. If you want to be exalted, you, know, you have to be a base. So I think that that's just a Christian principle. I think that that still applies. Um, even in a post-millennial worldview, and I have even said that exact statement that the way that the kingdom grows is through suffering, and um, it's it's through the blood of the martyrs, right? That's how the kingdom grows. Um, but um, I, I would agree with virtually everything that Brother Scott said. I'm trying to find things that I disagree with him on, but that's, you know, I agree with him on just about everything that he said, and um, yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So if we can do this one quickly, too, because there's just one more thing I just don't know. But obviously, a lot of what premillennialists teach and their timeline, too, um, you know, it's kind of all about Gog and Magog. And, you know, we have Armageddon, Millennium, Gog and Magog. So what, you know, what do amillennialists and postmillennialists do with Gog and Magog? Brother Clem? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, you know, if you look at um, Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine, there's some there's some interesting things. First of all, Gog and Magog, um, that whole situation. It seems like they're destroyed two or maybe even three times. Like, you know, wh wh which destruction is the main destruction? Um, you have something similar in the Book of Revelation where you have you have destruction, um, kind of a final destruction event in Revelation chapter 19. And then you got Revelation 20 and the thousand years. And then after the thousand years, you have an, another final destruction. So, um, you know, so people have been split on that. Um, 
I guess this is one of those differences between pre and um, and 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 amillennialism, postmillennialism is that they would take revelation. I would take revelation as being um, uh, recapitulatory. In, in other words, that it's telling the story over again from a different point of view. And I know that many premillennialists do that as well. Um, I think that that the, the entire book of Revelation does that seven different times, um, where it, it s- says the story from one point of view, stops, picks up from the beginning or or somewhere else in the timeline and, and talks about it again from a different point of view and so, so on and so forth. And I think Revelation 20 is that last um, that last recapitulatory pattern where it's speaking of that. So I would I would say that there is only one Gog Magog event. I personally think that that's still yet in the future. I think that that's that's um, that's what we're we're going toward. My struggle is is when I look at Ezekiel 38 and 39. At the end of Ezekiel 39, after you have the destruction of Gog and Magog and all this kind of stuff. You see, you see the gospel. You see Israel being reunited, and the Spirit being poured out, and the gospel going to the nations. Well, all of that stuff is happening right now. Um, Israel is is being regathered together. Uh, it's it's a un, unified kingdom in Christ. The Spirit's been poured out upon His people, and the gospel has gone to the nations. I mean, that's the, the temple really of the Book of Acts, and so and that comes at the end of Ezekiel thirty nine. So. You know, that's where it kind of throws me for a loop. Did that did that happen in the past? Um, is that is that speaking about 70 AD? And that's where I know some people would say that's you know that's talking about 70 AD. Um, maybe. So those are some of the things that I wrestle with personally. I think that the Gog Magog event is going to be in the future, um, but there's only going to be one instance of that, right? It, 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 when when um, when Jesus Christ comes again physically bodily. Um, you know, he's he's going to there's going to be people. I, I don't know how this is going to work out, but essentially they're rising up in rebellion against him. And he he ends all of that brings final judgment. So I think that is future. I think that's what Gog and Magog ideally is talking about. You know, I'll end it with that. OK, um, Pastor Baker, before you kind of give your explanation of Gog and Magog, I w- um, I've been starting to st- um, I've been really doing a deep dive on Daniel. And I found something in Daniel that I think can, you can make a connection to Gog and Magog that I think would probably help your guys' argument a little bit. I think I have an explanation for it, but I'll let you give yours, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll share uh, uh, something I noticed today in Daniel. But, Pastor Baker, what do you think about Gog and Magog? Yeah, yeah. So I also believe that Gog and Magog is future. So I believe, as I mentioned, that we're in the interadvental period. Uh, that's the term that's used, in, as I said, uh, in between the first and second coming of Christ. This is the reign of Christ now. I believe that there will be an apostasy. I, that, that is what the end of Revelation 20, in my view, is pointing to, and that there'll be a rebellion. That's the exact wording that I would use as well uh, at the end of uh, the reign of Christ. I, I alluded to earlier how all ages end in apostasy, and um, although we're not dispensationalists, we would still identify uh, general ages in which God has worked with um, in human history. For example, you have the age of innocence with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's obviously very different, an epoch or a very different epoch or era than other eras and epochs. And that ended in apostasy. They were, you know, exiled from the garden. We then have the flood, the judgment of the flood. And there always will be an accompanying or an associated judgment with it. And uh, you have the, the flood that occurred, right? So you have the time period in between uh, the exile and the flood, and that ended in apostasy as well. You have Israel, that, which follows. The, so the, the post-flood uh, age or time period where uh, Israel and the Old Covenant are instituted. And how did that end? But in apostasy again. And I think that the age of the Messianic era or the New Covenant age that we're in right now will also end in apostasy. And I take the book of Revelation as apocalyptic literature in being symbolic. And I take it as well as being a, a sort of rebellion. And many of the passages that pe- that speak to an apostasy in the end times, that's what I believe that that's referring to. And also um, some of the things that um, um, Brother Scott referred to of Gog and Magog, I mean, it's found in Ezekiel chapter 38, and 39, it speaks of the gathering of Israel. So I would believe it would point to that same exact. 
those events. And I believe that only full preterists are the ones that would say that I could be wrong about that, that Gog and Magog also is is uh, past and fulfilled. OK, so I guess so. Would you connect revelate like Gog and Magog with Armageddon? Is it basically another telling of that? Do you think that's basically the same thing? No, no. OK. Mm-mm. All right. So, yeah. So that was um, something too. I'll, I'll go ahead and read this passage. I noticed in Daniel, but uh, it says in Daniel 235, this is in the um, vision of the image. I'll start in 34 says, I saw us till a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so I I noticed that phrase, okay, because obviously it's talking about destroying these kingdoms. And it said, too, about as it carried them away, that there was found no place for them. And it reminded me of Revelation 20, 11. I saw a great white throne of them that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. So it's just like, it seems like there's definitely a connection there, you know, that maybe you can make it a little more symbolic about just the kingdoms of the earth uh, rather than just all the lost individuals. But uh, just kind of interesting use of that. But, uh, but yeah, but let's go ahead and uh, let's take some time to challenge each other's positions. So, you know, Brother Clem, what are what are when it comes to the premillennial position? What do you feel uh, the weaknesses are, uh, the questions that aren't being answered, uh, where they're wrong? What do you feel? Uh, what are some of your best challenges for the premillennialists? And then, you know, Pastor Baker, you do the same thing, and I'll, you know, I guess give my responses to those. Yeah, um, let's also throw some things out here um, as far as what I think. Um, one of the things that I struggle with with Revelation 20 um, and defining kind of this whole millennial period on on Revelation 20 is you have you have the rest of the Bible to contend with. Um, and, and I take the late date in, in revelation, um, as of now, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but just assuming that that's the case, you know, you had all of these other books of the Bible that were written before, um, before revelation and all of them speak to a particular timeline that the one that is the outlier, as far as kind of the timing, if there is a future thousand year kingdom is revelation and it comes at the very end. And so, um, through, you know, throughout the Bible, you have, you, you know, whenever it speaks of a resurrection, it's a general resurrection. You don't have split resurrections somewhere, even even in the Apostle Paul's writings. Um, you have uh, the, the big one. The big one for me is um, is the, the death of death. So Revelation or excuse me, First Corinthians 15 is probably, you know, if, if I hang my hat on anything first, it's, it's usually that passage because it says you know, speaks of two resurrections, Jesus, the first fruits, and then those that are that are at his coming. I hear a lot of people who like to squeeze in another resurrection. They say, you know, then then come at the end and they, they imply that that's mm-hmm. another resurrection there. But it doesn't say that. That's not what the text says. That's in reading an idea in the text. But it says he must reign until all enemies are put under his feet. feet. The last enemy is death. And so for me, I don't know. It, it, and you have a whole I mean. You have so many different things that go on with the second coming of Christ. With the second coming of Christ, you have bodily, physical, bodily resurrection. You have the final judgment. All of his enemies are destroyed, including death. And so for me, number one, I don't know where, um, you know, if the if the uh, future thousand years is going to have mortal people. I don't know where those mortal people come from because Paul specifically says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's in verse uh, 50, you know, he says, you know, we we must all be changed. Um, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, when Jesus comes again, the, the, the kingdom of God of the age to come begins um, and flesh and blood. In other words, these mortal human beings cannot enter into the kingdom of God, which is why we have to be changed. So how are there mortal sinful people that end up in the kingdom of God? 
how is their procreation going on? Because elsewhere, I think it's Luke chapter 20, Jesus says that, um, you know, talking about, you know, the, the children of the resurrection, they neither marry nor given in marriage. Um, and so and, and so you have the situation there where you have death for another thousand years. Well, I, I, I don't I that's probably the, the one of the main things that that I struggled with as a historic premillennialist when I was that is how, how does this work? Because all these indicators seem to suggest that when Jesus comes again, that's the end of death. And I don't know how you have death for another 1,000 years. It means death isn't really defeated. Um, it's not defeated until the 1,000 years are finished. But that's all read into 1 Corinthians 15. It's not read out of it. So, um, so yeah, I'll let, you, I'll yeah. let you respond. Well, yeah, and those are definitely legitimate objections. And one thing I, I try very hard to do on this program, too, whenever I give my position, is I try to be very honest on the basis and um if something's based on clear scripture uh i'll you know I'll, I'll do that if something is based on the assumption of something that is not clear i try to be honest about that too and so i guess the way i would respond to a lot of the things you said um it's based on the assumption that i'm right about the millennium i'm right on the timeline because for example you know you mentioned the resurrection when you read first corinthians 15 um, it doesn't look like, yeah, I, you're right. There are, people are kind of reading in that additional resurrection because we do kind of need another resurrection. If people are dying in the millennium, well, then you, you do, you need, you need another resurrection. But so to me, what the way on, under the assumption that we're right on our timeline, the way I'm reading revelation 20, when it says, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection to me the fact that there is that first resurrection implies another one and then we see the dead small and great stand before god now the problem i have with that is we don't see any saved ones it, it, it looks like they're all lost and all getting cast in the lake of fire you know which leaves me to have to answer what about all the people that get saved during the millennium do they just stay alive and not die Did, would that mean they get glorified right away you know, there, there's so much, there's so much assumption and in the premillennial world, um, like a lot of these things I'm saying, people say, yes, that is it. But we don't have clear scriptures on that. So to me, the way we prove all of these assumptions that we have, that's not really based on explicit scripture is I think it's on, again, the nature of the kingdom now and the purpose of the future kingdom. And I just don't think anybody's really talked about that. And I have opinions on that, and but I'm open to challenges on that to see if it holds up to scrutiny. So I guess what I would say is I do believe that when Jesus Christ came at his first coming and he, uh, I believe he was fulfilling prophecy, fulfilling his obligation to Israel at when he is presenting the kingdom to them. However, Jesus did not find what he was looking for at that first coming. And I believe what he was looking for is spelled out in places like Ezekiel. I think there's examples in Isaiah, Zechariah, all these different places. And I pers what I personally believe is the uh, one of the reasons the kingdom was taken from them was because they had not produced fruit. They didn't have the souls there. And he was not able to bring you know to raise up a righteous people through the things of the temple and so i personally believe that when he brought in that new and better covenant i believe we have been doing the job for the last two thousand years that israel was supposed to be doing in bringing people to christ and in getting souls ready for him and that way when he comes the second time this time he will have a people that are ready and when we see him we're going to be glorified so we can be ministers in that kingdom and so we can have inheritance in the kingdom. So I think it's possible, it would be my opinion, uh, based on the assumption I'm right in these things, that lost people can exist on earth in that kingdom, but they will not receive any inheritance in that kingdom. I believe those who will receive inheritance are going to be those who are saved, those who have been glorified after they've seen Christ. And then 
we are uh, during that kingdom, we're going to see Jesus Christ, you know, defeating enemies like it was prophesied, um, setting up a lot of the things and doing a lot of the things that, um, you know, for the world that were promised to Israel, you know, if they obey all of these things and they just, they never did. So I, I believe there's a lot of promises, earthly promises that need to be fulfilled. I believe there's a lot of legal things that have to take place, but they can only take place with uh, people who have been cleansed through the things of the new covenant rather than the things of the old covenant. And so, you know, uh, I, you know, I don't know if that ad addresses all the objections, but I guess I'm just saying a lot of these things that you're bringing up, there's not explicit verses that answer those things. You know, they're, they're, our responses are built on assumptions that we're right about certain things. So I don't, does that answer I, anything? Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that because that's, that's the subject. I mean, what you, you I mean, that's a very honest answer. Um, it is based upon assumptions. Um, and that, and that's, and we all do that to some extent. Um, and so that's, that's just the, that's just the truth of it. Um, yeah, I, I understand. I mean, obviously I, I disagree with some of the things that you said, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to, go into all of that. I, I appreciate the answer that you gave. Um, but, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. So, and again, cause again, a lot, of, a lot of what I'm trying to explain there, it's, it's my opinion. It's based on a lot. There's a lot of scripture we can go into, but you know, I would encourage people when you hear stuff like that, does that directly contradict something in the scripture, you know, and, um, it, it might, you know, it, it might, but, um, it is so much when it, when it comes to the millennium, Premillennialism, it is. It's ninety-five percent speculation, and I, 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 I will be the first to admit that, which is why I'm a lot more gracious towards other positions than other people. But Pastor Baker, what are your some of your, I guess, main objections to premillennialism? Um, well, I could give some specifics uh, because it would be exactly what Brother Scott said again, uh, because our positions are so similar. So what would, you know, I guess the way that I would frame it is that I think that the premillennial position is based uh, on a misunderstanding of one passage, Revelation chapter number 20. And I would also cite the exact same passage as what is meant to be the explicit, uh, the intention and uh, and the purpose of 1 Corinthians 15 is to give us the order of the resurrection. And uh, and also it's telling us uh, not only the order of the resurrection, the timing of Christ's coming. Um, and that refers to Christ as being the first fruits. Um, so we have explicit passages repeatedly all throughout the Bible that lays out a timeline for us. And by the time we get to the book of Revelation— we already have a, a very clear timeline from what I would say are not implicit passages, you know, uh, or, or um, uh, conjecture that's based on passages where we have to imply things. I think a general resurrection is taught clearly throughout the Bible. When Christ talks about um, the resurrection, it's the resurrection of the just and the unjust. When he talks about judgment, he talks about the judgment of the just and the unjust. I think when we look at the timing of the resurrection of even those that are mentioned um, living at the time of Paul and living at the time of Christ, there is th those that will be the saints that is that will be resurrected. The Christians are going to be resurrected with the unjust, and I think that that shows a, a mass inconsistency, just a, a vast, I should say, inconsistency with the premillennial interpretation. Of Revelation chapter number twenty, so general resurrection and general judgment taught consistently throughout Scripture, um, I would say would be the first thing. I think First Corinthians fifteen I would cite um, as being the clear passage, and he even referred to the objection that people will give with the how they'll use the word they'll they'll try to fit in um, another. Uh, resurrection there at the timing of then, like right there's the kingdom, but there's no kingdom mentioned. And the word then literally means at that time. So then come at the end means like at that time comes the end. When, and that is when? That is at Christ's return. So it's telling you that Christ is the first fruits. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming, then at that time cometh the end. Well, that jives with all of Scripture. And not only that, 
Paul says a few verses later that that's when death is swallowed up in victory. Well, when do we see death swallowed up in victory? At the end of the millennial reign of Christ, which that timeline builds out perfectly. And even if we take an approach of Revelation 20, uh, which would be, you know, and I think this would also be a difference in the pre-mill perspective of Revelation and a post or mill perspective, would be that we would, we would have a different hermeneutic when we approach it. So if we approach the book of Revelation— as being, as I referred to it earlier, as apocalyptic literature, it's very, it's heavily symbolic. And I've heard you say many times, Pastor McMurtry, that it that everybody un- identifies all the symbolism in the Book of Revelation. What I would say is that the post mill and ob mill position are the only positions that consistently interpret the Book of Revelation in that genre, and that the the pre mill perspective just goes back and forth between literal with no standard to appeal to. So it's just. You know, uh, and really the only reason why that occurs, in my opinion, is because of, uh, uh, as you refer to their assumptions and, 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 and a, um, a, a pre-commitment to a system. So I think that all of Scripture points to a general resurrection, a general um, uh, judgment. I think that the Gospels repeatedly point to that occurring at Christ's coming. I think we, if we look at... Um, the the clearest verse that states that its intention is to be uh, to give us the timing of the resurrection and Christ's coming that it also fits that same exact timeline and then we get to the book of Revelation and if we interpret symbolically we interpret it symbolically that also seems to fit in my opinion we see death swallowed up in victory at the end of um, Revelation chapter number 20, we see the resurrection, we see judgment, we see Christ reigning before that, and um, and then prior to it, you know, I would obviously, all the way up until Revelation 19, I would see a lot of those events as being 70 AD. One thing that I think is important to throw out there just like in sake of, uh, for sake of integrity and, and honesty, uh, I want to agree with something that I believe that you, you um, I, I know you would agree with it. Pastor McMurtry, but something that I didn't I didn't get a chance to concur to that Brother Scott said earlier, and that's not to be um, wedded or I believe he used the word married to a position too tightly, not to be too dogmatic. And I think you know that's the attitude that we need to have as Christians, especially mm-hmm. when approaching things where we can see that Christians have a variety of posi- of of opinions on that. We need to be have a little bit more humility in these things and be open to to being um, you know pressed and challenged and uh and and converting if somebody you know we should we should be truth seekers in these things and we should have humility in these issues so um but those yeah. would be my that would be you know what i would say about my problems with it the timeline all throughout scripture is consistent when we get to the book of revelation if we take it symbolically that also is the same timeline in my opinion yeah. Well, I'm definitely married to a position, but I get in a lot of trouble for flirting with other ones all the time. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, so, um, yeah, when it comes to the, uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, resurrection for sure, when you read like Daniel 12, you know, it looks, you know, it looks like one general resurrection of the just and unjust, you know, when you're until you get the revelation, it definitely seems like it's one single event. And so when, when I read Revelation 20, to me, what we're seeing is where, you know, more is being revealed. And, you know, to me, it would be that thousand year kingdom. And so while I understand, again, everybody symbolizes things. Absolutely. It's true. Premillennialists, we go back and forth on uh, what's symbolic, what's literal. Uh, but when we are all in agreement that the resurrection is literal, To me, when you look at Revelation chapter 20 and you see those that were beheaded and uh, and that they they you know, they they were beheaded because they wouldn't take the mark. But then it says they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It's talking about their resurrection. So this reign that they do that, you know, it's after the resurrection. So the thing is, if that thousand years, if that's the millennium and it's representative of, of where we are now. Well, that doesn't make any sense because we're seeing people who are resurrected reigning with Christ. Therefore, this has to be in the future. And that's gonna, you know, that's gonna be the biggest go-to every premillennialist is gonna go to. No, we are seeing the dead raised, 
And part of their reward is they're living and reigning with Christ a thousand years. And so we are, it is being revealed that there's a thousand year space between the resurrection of the just and the unjust that was not previously known. But that's not really out of the character of, of God to, you know, do something like that. Again, we still often have to try to figure out how say people die and then resurrect again, uh, you know, in the future. But what what do you guys say to that? If the resurrection is literal then, and these ones who are resurrected live and reign with Christ a thousand years, I, I, I that's right. I don't know what you guys would say to that. Well, Scott, you go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and yeah, take a stab at that. That's that's I think one of the weaknesses of um, of a, of an all Miller uh, post mill position um, is is the language. I mean, that's where a lot of the um, the contention comes in is you know how to interpret that how to interpret that one that one passage and how that looks. Um, scholars have have rightly pointed out um, uh, anastasis, you know, the term for resurrection that that always that always means a a physical bodily resurrection something you know uh, something that rises from from the dead and so many have pointed out well if that's the case then that you know shouldn't shouldn't that first resurrection shouldn't that be physical um, and i would i would concur that it absolutely should be physical where i have um where i have tried to reconcile that is that Again, and this is this is from one of those hermeneutical principles of just interpreting scripture with scripture. Well, it says in Revelation 20 that uh, what is it, 20 verse 5 or whatever it is, that that's the, the first resurrection. Okay. Um, well, we know also in 1 Corinthians 15 that, that Christ is that literally, he was the first resurrection, Christ the first fruits. And so uh, for me, it, it, you know, what, what, what does that mean? Well, first of all, we look at the language in particular, Revelation 20, John sees the souls of them that were beheaded, right? He doesn't see, he doesn't see physical raised bodies. He sees the souls of them that were beheaded. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The way I take that is that by virtue of, uh, of Jesus's physical resurrection, that believers take part in that. Um, spiritually speaking. And we know that's true. Uh, the Apostle Paul talks about that in, in Romans chapter 6. We've died with Christ. We've been buried with Christ. We've risen together uh, with Christ. We are to reckon ourselves as, as dead, as having died to sin. And so there is a sense in which, you know, every single believer who has trusted Christ by faith, that, that we have participated in his in his in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and as such, we have we are um, we are participants in his resurrection, in the first resurrection. I mean, we are called his body for for crying out loud. Um, the only other piece that I would add to this, and again, I think for some people that might be a struggle, that might be um, that might be a stretch, but I think we find something similar, a similar teaching, and this is this is helpful. Um, John the Apostle, who wrote Revelation. And in his in his gospel in John chapter five, I think he helps us to understand this and where he might be coming from at this as well. So in, in John chapter five and verse twenty four, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they and they that hear shall live. So here, here he's saying, look, the, the time is coming. It's, it's now here. The dead are going to hear, and they're going to live. If you if you receive Christ, you've passed from death to life. And then just a few a few verses later, he says this in verse twenty eight: Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So here in verse 20, 20, uh, 28 and 29, it really does appear that he is talking about a physical resurrection, a general resurrection of the just and the unjust together. He talks more about that in John chapter 6 as well. But it seems to be, if you if you look at verses, uh, what is it, 20, 24 and 25, and compare that to 28 and 29, there's some similarities, but there's some differences. 
And I think the first couple of verses, 24 and 25, are speaking of the, the spiritual aspect of, of, of our participation in Jesus's literal physical resurrection from the grave. And it's by virtue of his physical resurrection, the first resurrection, that we have passed from death to life. A believer who's received Christ is saved. Now, I know there's a future aspect in which we're, you know, we're going to have our bodily resurrection as well. But we have passed from death to life. If you receive Christ, your sins are forgiven. You, you've gone from death to life. But that physical part hasn't yet taken place. And so I think, I think the seeds of this idea of a first and the second resurrection, a spiritual aspect and a physical aspect, are right there in John's gospel as well. And so that's that's how I would answer that. Um, but I, that's a tough one. That's a, that's a tough one. And I understand how people um, really argue and 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 how that's a, that's a hard one for them to come to in Revelation 20. And my my appeal, I'll just end with this. My appeal is, is that, um, you know, we should we should try to apply that hermeneutical principle of, you know, taking the clear passages and interpreting the difficult passages in light of the clear. I think it's it's a little bit wonky, uh, a little bit goofy to take an unclear passage, a passage that so many people fight about, Revelation chapter 20, uh, where there's so many different views, and then to try to make the rest of the Bible conform around someone's preconceived notion of how they think that's going to go, you know, take place. I would rather take the bulk of what the Bible says, and, and take what is clearly given to us, and then in light of the clear, interpret. The, the the difficult portions you know in light of that and and so that that's how i i would approach that okay yeah well obviously there are places in the bible where yeah we are risen with christ and i guess too if you want to throw it back at us about you know well we take this literally well then it's just those who get beheaded you know that are resurrected there but yeah no that no that's interesting uh pastor baker what do you have to say about the revelation my revelation 20 objection yeah so i would approach it the same way i would take the the clear scripture first i would take the timeline and i would read uh the book of revelation as if it is as john says that they are signified you know we see symbols and signs being uh communicated uh to us uh, which which represent reality so i would look at revelation chapter number 20 and i i uh, interpret that as the time period is the reign of Christ. And when we piece together the timeline, we see that Christ is in fact reigning now and that we are reigning as kings and priests with Christ today. And uh, let me um, back up real quick and just throw this out there that I agree with Brother Scott in that this is one of the more difficult passages. And, um, you know, I've, I've, listen to a lot of different people's explanation to try to work my way through this passage just because it is a, the one of the more so difficult passages for my position and uh, as he mentioned you know that's one of the the even uh, harder difficulties of the passage is that the greek word that that underlies this here is used every other time for a physical resurrection but i would also appeal to the fact that it says the souls of them I would appeal to the fact that this is a vision and that he's seeing uh, uh, successive events that are playing out and that following uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the consummation of the new covenant, the, the, the uh, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We now have entered into uh, the reign of Christ. And, of course, that's going to be um, further consummated at the eternal state. Um, but... Um, you know, Christ is reigning now, and we, we have the passage there that refers to him as the first resurrection. And I believe that that is also a reference to Christ. And I'm going to pull something up here real quick. Um, if we look in Revelation chapter number 1, verse number 5 and 6, and this would just be another passage also from John uh, the Apostle, authoring this, of course, Revelation chapter number 1. As he pointed out from John, that this seems to be a theme from John. But it says this in verse 5 and 6, kind of giving us the prologue, and I believe preparing us to point us to Revelation 20. When we get there, um, kind of shapes our minds. But it says this in Revelation 1, verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So we have a reference in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, of him being the first begotten of the dead. Even in this 
very book. And then notice verse six, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. So we actually have defined for us, in my opinion, I believe that this, that's what this is, um, what it means later for uh, um, the first resurrection when it's mentioned in Revelation 20. And I believe it's a reference to Jesus Christ being risen from the dead, us being risen in him, and then we are co-heirs with him. And during his reign, this, this period of time when he ascends to heaven and he reigns from the right hand of the Father, that um, he is the first resurrection. We take part in that first resurrection because he is a king and he is a priest today. We are also, and it's present tense. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 is present tense and says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. And as we mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 also refers to uh, Jesus is Christ, uh, Jesus' resurrection as being the, him being specifically the first fruits of the resurrection. And then what is the other passage? Uh, Colossians chapter number one, verse 18, I have it here. So this is all throughout the New Testament. It says, and he is the, the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So there again, so this is a doctrine once we see the passage, we, or we see this teaching you know, occurring repeatedly, we would consider it a doctrine. So I would take, first of all, the clear timeline as we, as we mentioned earlier. Um, if I lay that timeline over the timeline that Revelation gives me, I believe that I can, I can um, come up with explanations from Scripture in comparing Scripture with Scripture. Um, where it points me to answers, and that is that Christ is that first resurrection. And furthermore, one thing that you know um, that I'm working through that may, my opinion at this point would be about, uh, I believe that you know we, we see the the stone smiting the feet of the image, and it does so on earth, and it says that the kingdom grows on the earth at that time. And I believe the reason why he's seeing that is John in this vision, the souls on earth is because this is picturing the kingdom of God coming to earth. Right. So that's, that's why I believe the earth, uh, earthly tones are mentioned there in that particular passage, just to kind of throw something additional out there. Um, but, uh, that would be my interpretation of revelation chapter number 20 and that Christ is the first fruits and that the first resurrection is representing us being raised in him, us during this time period while he is reigning uh, in heaven uh, from the right hand of the Father. We are reigning on earth uh, as kings and priests, as co-heirs with him. Okay. Well, you know, one thing you could have in your favor that I'm just kind of acknowledging is we often forget that the book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's amazing how little focus Christ gets throughout the book of Revelation and it is very interesting if you kind of read through it, trying to learn not so much more about what's going to happen to you, but trying to learn more about Jesus. It kind of puts certain things in perspective that I think is pretty interesting. But, but yeah. So okay. Well, hey, let's let's beat up on amillennialism now for a little bit. And uh, P Pastor Baker, I'll let you uh, start off. What do you think are just some of your biggest objections to amillennial amillennialism? and what some of their weak points are. Yeah, to be honest, it might be a little bit difficult with Brother mm -hmm. Scott just because it's so similar. So you could say maybe because I believe in the apostasy in the end uh, that I'm kind of a grumpy post mill and that he's a happy <laughs> ah mill. But um, I would say specifically that um, the the lack of an earthly application, and again, that's that's where it makes it difficult for for that to apply to Brother Scott. Uh, so he he does take a, um, a an earthly application. I believe that there are multitudes of passages um, in the Old Testament and the New Testament that speak very, as I used a moment ago, in earthy terms um, about the millennial reign of Christ. And your typical Amil will apply all of that to heaven very often. You know, there's, there's of course degrees and that's why I kind of post mill and on mill, um, will run together. But, um, I would say the the lack of applying, uh, scripture to the earthly kingdom during this time. And, um, I would also, um, just reference, uh, you know, for him again, he's, he's optimistic, so it's difficult, but the lack of optimism, 
I think there are multitudes of scriptures. So not only am, am I post-mill in that I believe that Christ comes back after the millennial, as he does, but I would say that that big difference is, is that I believe the kingdom will spread to all nations. And um, for example, I think, and he can tell me what he thinks about these passages, um, I never personally, with the position of premillennialism, had an explanation for the parables that speak of the the kingdom of God being as a mustard seed that's planted. It's you know it's the smallest of all. It's planted and then it grows into this huge tree that all the fowls come and dwell in. And that's a picture or that's that's symbolizing all of the the nations or all of the uh, the Gentiles coming uh, into the kingdom of God. And that's a theme, obviously, that we see uh, not only in that parable. We, it's a theme throughout Scripture that all nations from the east and the west are going to come into the kingdom. But you also have the leaven uh, that uh, the kingdom of God is like unto leaven and two lumps, and they you 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 put the leaven in, and it spreads until it fills both lumps. The entire lump is leaven. You have um, the passages that prophesy of Christ's kingdom. And it says, of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. I mean, that's pretty clear that it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to increase. It's like leaven that's going to continue to spread. It's like this mustard seed that will be planted, and it comes small. It comes, um, you know, uh, like Christ and 12 apostles, small, and then it grows until all the nations are converted. And then it all points back, or I would say it's all predicated upon the prophecy of the stone that's cut out from, and sometimes people miss this, but it's cut out from a mountain, and that's the mountain of the kingdom of God that's in heaven. And I think this right here is really one of the things that that I would draw a line between a lot of ah mills and post mills, is that I believe that that kingdom of heaven, you know, Christ brought that kingdom. He was a stone that was that was hewn out or that was cut out from the mountain in heaven, the kingdom of, of God in heaven. And he came to the earth, and the kingdom of God came to the earth, and it started off as a stone, but then it grows into a great mountain. So that's what I would say. I'd say that that's very earthy terms, and that would be my explanation also of Revelation 20. That's why I kind of threw that out there to, to, to prep us for where we would be going with disagreements on ah mill and post mill eventually. Um, I believe there are very earthy terms, and I don't think that that Christ's kingdom is just stuck in heaven. I believe that his kingdom has come to earth and that he, as Brother Scott mentioned, we're the body of Christ. He's our head. He's He is ruling. And through us, and that's why he gave us his spirit, we go forth and we we conquer the nations. We don't do so, do so with a physical sword. We do so, do so, excuse me, with a spiritual sword, and that is the word of God and the gospel. And his enemies are being made his footstool on earth earth so i take and maybe you know right there we can kind of see a little bit more of a difference that i take a lot of this as an earthly application that his that his kingdom came to earth and i think that's what daniel 2 teaches i think that's what christ is saying the eminence uh, you know the kingdom of god is at hand repent ye and believe the gospel that is that the kingdom of god is coming to earth now that kingdom may look very different to a pre-millennialist and it you know it looks very different to me now compared to you know my previous view when I was a premillennialist. But hopefully I'm trying to flesh that out a little bit so we can have some disagreements here. So let's see if I I can get Brother Scott to bite. Yeah yeah thanks for that. Um, you know <laughs> just kind of an anecdote. Um, I live in a beautiful part of of the world and um, and the state next to us is um is south dakota if you drive from from my town into the black hills of south dakota it is just absolutely beautiful and i remember and i've done this many many times driving to to rapid city which is about a couple of hours away and just looking at the scenery and i can remember having visions and like you know god during and at that time i was a a, a pre-millennialist and i'm thinking god you know would you would you let me have this area of the earth you know that kind of thing and 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 so you know, as my thoughts have began to change, that was kind of a disappointment. Like, oh man, that's that, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, all all that said, um, I, I appreciate what what um, Pastor Baker is is saying there. Yeah, all millennialists, um, and that, that's kind of the big thing with all millennialism is they believe that the the, the kingdom is spiritual. 
again, that's that's something that I that I disagree with. And part of this comes, you know, to, to my whole Bible her, hermeneutic as far as where where the Bible was and, and where it's going. You know, we go from creation to new creation. And if we look at the very beginning in creation, you know, if we were to really examine and drill down into Genesis, you know, we've got the we got the earth and then we got it, uh, Eden and then we've got a garden within Eden. And and without getting too deep and wild and crazy, it's my belief that that Genesis is teaching in that and that pristine state where God is dwelling with man in the garden, that that there is some kind of overlap between heaven and earth going on um, in, in in the garden. In, in other words, the lines are blurred and we kind of get, get glimpses of this. You know, there's a there's a there's a talking snake like where, where did this come from? And so I believe that there was a, a, an overlap of heaven and earth. And I think that's, you know, as far as the, the the fall is concerned, that's that's one of the big results of the fall is there there's this there's this separation, and we still deal with the separation. A lot of people um, have this idea that heaven is far far away, um, and we're down here on earth, and there's you know there's a big big distance between the two. Um, I like what, and I'm going to read this. This is in John chapter one verse fifty one. Jesus uh, speaking to Nathaniel, he says this. He says. Um, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. I remember, like, what in the world does that mean? Of course, we, it's an allusion to Jacob's ladder. But instead of the ladder that's connecting heaven to earth, it's it's Jesus. The angels are descending and ascending upon the Son of Man. In other words, Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the thing that connects. When we look at uh, the temple. And um, in, in temple theology, what was the significance about the tabernacle or temple? Well, it was it was the heaven and earth spot. It's where it's where God dwelt with mankind. It's where His presence was. It was it was the hot spot of God, uh, which is why there was such a big deal of of you know being being pure and, and that being a you know being a a place of holiness. Well, Jesus is a living, walking, talking temple, right? In other words, he he is literally the place where heaven and earth overlap. And interlock, and I think this takes on a greater significance than when we get into the New Testament, and we think about who who we are in Christ. We are His body. We are we are called His temple. And so, in Ephesians chapter one, um, it's, there's there's a couple of great uh, verses. Ephesians one and verse ten says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth even in him. Uh, later on in the chapter, in, uh, I'll just read verse 22, it says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be uh, the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so we get this image of, of the body of Christ filling both heaven and earth. Of course, at the ascension, what happened? Something physical, Jesus' physical resurrected body ascended to a spiritual place, to heaven. Jesus is physically at the right hand of God. How does that work? I don't know how that works. That's just what the Bible says. But there's 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 something else. Not only is there something now physical that is that is seated in heaven, but there is now something spiritual from heaven that now indwells believers, namely his spirit. And so there's this connection. There's this there's this connection. Um, you know, if we are the temple of the living God, and and heaven and earth. You know, in, in, in temple theology, or kind of where heaven and earth over overlap and interlock, this has big implications, and we see this in other passages as well. As far as heavenly Zion, Hebrews chapter twelve, verse twenty-two through twenty-four says, "You have come, present tense. You have come unto Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem." Well, I don't feel like I've come to Zion, but it, it's talking about that in present sense. So all that to say, where where I'm going with this is, I think. You know, when we're talking about the kingdom and, 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 and um, you know, what it looks like, it is it is not just spiritual. The kingdom of God isn't just happening in, he in heaven. I agree with Brother Tyler as far as those uh, passages in, in uh, Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7. Um, all of the different parables, I agree with them, you know, wholeheartedly um, as far as the explanation. When Jesus talked about, you know, the kingdom is going gonna, is gonna to be small and it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's been happening over, over the last 2,000 years and it will continue until Jesus comes again. So there is both a, a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect where uh, Jesus is ruling and reigning in heaven. And it, there is a sense in which we rule and reign with him. But this gets to the, you know, the issue of what does it mean to rule and reign? 
we have this idea that ruling and reigning means that we have someone under us and we're barking orders at him. In other words, you know, that, you know, we're the boss and they're serving us. Right. But Jesus had something to say about that to his disciples. He says, look, that's how the Gentiles do it. But you're not supposed to be like the Gentiles. He who wants to be greatest must be the least. He, he you know, who wants to be the master must be the servant. Um, I came not to, 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 you know, to have people serve me, but but to serve, you know, I butcher in the verse, but you, you get the idea there. And so we we are the body of Christ. We are his hands and feet. And what does ruling and reigning look like? It looks like serving. It looks like loving. It looks like doing what Jesus did. And as we're indwelt with his spirit, I, li I like to say this, you know, what is what is the physical manifestation of, of Jesus's reign in the earth today? Well, it's his body and we're the body and we are very much physical and we are very much dwelt with his spirit, something physical and spiritual going on at the same time. And we have a, a real impact in the earth and by ruling and reigning, I believe that's serving and loving and evangelism and all the things that, 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 you know, we would espouse that, that Christians ought to do and be about, um, you know, in, in physical, in physical terms. And so I think all of that is going on right here and right now. And, um, Man, I don't know if that does it justice. I was trying to speed through that. There's a lot there that you know I could I try to unpack, but the sum of it is it's it's spiritual and physical, and that's where I would agree with all millennialists who say, well, you know, you're you know, it's oh, the the kingdom of God is only happening in in heaven, so we have to wait till we get to heaven, then we can start ruling and reigning. And I think there is some spiritual aspect going on in heaven. I don't know what kind of interaction the saints in heaven have in in you know in the physical realm on earth. Um, but I tend to believe that there is something going on there, that there's there's some kind of interaction. And how do I know that? Well, there, I, I know there's spiritual and physical interaction going on right now, even with my, in my own body being filled with the spirit. So there's a lot of things, that, you know, I just I don't know about speculation on my part um, on, on some of that. But but that's that's kind of how I would I would see that. Okay. You know, one thing that everyone in the theological world needs to do is just admit when they're speculating. Just admit it. Speculation doesn't mean you're wrong, but it means you could be. And that's always kind of a, a helpful approach to take. And so, um, yeah, so if, I guess what I'll do right now, too, I'm going to kind of give you my challenge. And I guess this would apply to your position, too, Pastor Baker. So I will I'll kind of throw this at Brother Clem and then I'll let you respond. And then Pastor Baker, I'll let you respond to it, too. And then Brother Clem, you can kind of give your. Uh, response to, uh, I guess, against the uh, post-millennial position. But for me, um, when I'm listening to, you know, you, Brother Clem, talk about the amillennial position, again, I'm I'm agreeing with a lot of what you're saying. It's like, this is true, this is true, this is true. I feel like, though, um, you're jumping to the false conclusion of there not being the physical kingdom. And so to me, it seems like there's certain things that I, I've not heard these things addressed. So I will th throw these verses out there and see what you would do with them. Um, I th I'm sure you're familiar with what the premillennials would do with them. But for example, Matthew 19, uh, 27, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that you which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And I don't believe that would be him, you know, them judging all perfect people. I don't know why we would need to do that. To me, this is something that is yet to happen. I don't believe it did happen, you know, be in uh, in the first century with them. They were treated terrible, you know. And then it goes on to say, and every one that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands. For my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first should be last and the last should be first. And to me, this implies that in this kingdom that's to come, you know, there are going to be those who are, are still above others. This doesn't really sound new heaven and new earth where we're all just perfect. I guess that could still be true in the new heaven and new earth. But again, what's the point of having a hundredfold? You know, based on what you did here, if everything is perfect, again, in the future, to me, it seems like um, there is going to be a period of time of life 
you know, similar to, to what we know now, just way better, that I would say is distinct from the new heaven and new earth. And um, and so would you, you know, when it comes to the them judging, sitting on 12 thrones, judging 12 tribes of Israel, I don't really know how you would spiritualize that. And then, um, well, and I, and then I, I uh, Acts 3, 19, I'll read this passage, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And I'm not going to read everything in that passage, but to me, when they're preaching this to the Jews, you know, the Jews, they had this understanding of a kingdom. You know, they they believed they were going to inherit the earth sometime and they were going to defeat all the heathen. And it seems like here in Acts 3, when he, you know, he's referring to that time that's still to come and they must receive Christ in order to participate in that. So I guess when I read those passages, I just can't help but see this physical kingdom where we are ruling and reigning over people, where Jesus is going to be ruling with a rod of iron, where there will still be judgment, where there will be punishment. And, you know, there it doesn't seem like there's any way you can uh, just spiritualize that and say that the, uh, you know, the apostles already sat on the 12 thrones or even are currently doing that, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, to me, the dispensationalists or the, the, the premillennial crowd, uh, they kind of, to me, that's one of their strong points. So what would you say to that? Which one do you want to answer first? Let, let's do or, the, tw or, the 12 okay. tribes of the, them sitting on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So looking at Matt, so here's how I've approached Matthew, uh, chapter 19, you mentioned verse 27 and 27 and 28. So in verse 28, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, um, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So um, how I've approached that is, you know, looking at that word regeneration, what does the word regeneration mean? Well, there's there's only one other time in Scripture that that word is used, uh, and that is in, in Titus chapter 3. And verse five, where it says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so regeneration there clearly uh, speaks to me that he is talking about that that time when when the spirit would be poured out. It's in John and I, for, I think it's in John. Somewhere in the Gospels, I want to say it's in John uh, where there's this little, little, um, you know, little side you know, information piece where it says the spirit had not yet been poured out. And so obviously this is part of the new covenant. Part of the new covenant is the spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. I believe this is what regeneration is all about. And so when did, when did, when did Peter, when, when, when did he, when did that regeneration take place with him? When, when was, when was the spirit poured out? Well, it was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Um, and it's interesting, uh, you know, m you know, seeing that connection to Pentecost, because it says there in verse 28 again, that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the son of man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Well, this is what Peter is talking about. This is his Pentecost address. His Pentecost address is that, you know, hey, look, these people that you see that are they're doing miraculous things. They're not drunk like you suppose. But this is actually the promise that was written in the prophets of the spirit being poured out. And 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 he he's he makes the connection that it is because Jesus is now seated in, in the throne, uh, enthroned right next to God in God's right hand, that he has the authority now to to disperse the spirit so this thing can come to pass. And so, um, so you know, is Jesus sitting on the throne today? Abs absolutely he is. Um, there's other passages as well. Let me just kind of turn over to one. Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, i got to get there. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, right? So this is one of the letters, this is the church to Laodicea. And again, you know, keeping, keeping in mind the context, this was a real letter 
to a real group, group of people in the first century. All right. And so Jesus has something to say. Verse 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down in uh, uh, with my father in his throne. And if you look there, that's all, that's all present tense. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, and so there there is a sense, you know, just think of other verses as well. Like in Ephesians, you know, we are seated in the heavenlies with with Christ. Um, and so I, I, I think this where, where me personally, where I kind of got tripped up with with things is I had a particular idea of what it meant to rule and reign. And the thing that that helped me to balance that is um, is the passage. I, I don't have it right in front of me at the moment. We're, 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 you know, the the apostles are arguing who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, right? That's what they're wanting to know. Who do I get to rule and reign over? You know, what's going to be what's going to be the pecking order? Where do where do I stack up? And uh, and he he rebukes them for that, and and he 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 turns the whole idea of ruling and reigning on its head, which is which is not inconsistent with God, because if we look at again Genesis chapter one verses twenty. Uh, Chapter 1, 26 through 28, when mankind is first created, he's created to exercise dominion. Uh, Psalm 8 is a commentary on, on Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Um, and, and so what is what is mankind's function from the very beginning of the Bible? It is to rule and reign as a vice regent, as God's image, um, in the earth, underneath God. Um, and that's exactly the place that Je is why Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. He has is, he is fulfilled what was designed for mankind all along. Um, and so this idea of ruling and reigning, it's not its not this idea that the Gentiles have of, of barking orders and making people serve us and being in charge, so to speak, but it's the idea of, of serving, the idea of loving. The Sermon of, on the Mount is a great explanation of all this as well, as far as, you know, it, it is an upside down kingdom. They were expecting the kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is, is is absolutely about the kingdom, but it's completely upside down. It's paradoxical to everything that they that they imagined it to be. And it's not like the kingdoms of this world. It's something it's something different. And so I think there's a sense and this is where you know I, I mentioned some speculation. I, I believe that there is an absolute sense in which the apostles, as far as their ministry is concerned, that 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 very much constitutes ruling and reigning. What they were doing here on this earth as far as serving their fellow man, uh, spreading the gospel, the authority that they were given. Jesus says, you know, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That's when were they going to have the keys during their ministry. And so there is something, something special about their ministry, which constitutes, I believe, ruling and reigning. Now, the question for me is, is that, does that continue in some sense in the spiritual realm? That's where I would speculate and say, well, I, I don't know. I like to think so. I think there's probably a whole lot more going on in the spiritual realm that we we are, you know, that we realize. But um, but that that part is speculation. I, I do think, though, that there's a sense of as far as ruling and reigning, when we look at all the language and, and all of these different stories and we compile all these things together, I think that's what was going on. So did they rule and reign? Um, absolutely. When we think I'll, I'll end with this. Um, the at the beginning of Acts, they're wondering when the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel. And I think by by that they meant when is the consummated kingdom? When when are sinners going to be judged? When is, when is this whole thing going to be wrapped up? And Jesus again reminds them, hey, it's, it's you, you don't need to worry about that. That's that's all the Father's prerogative. Um, you know, he and he mentioned that in Matthew chapter twenty four as well. Only the Father knows those things. But he does tell them how the the kingdom is going to be reconstituted. Uh, he he says that the kingdom is going to start in Jerusalem, uh, in Judea, uh, spread to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In Ezekiel chapter 37, we have the picture of a reunited kingdom, the tribe of Ephraim, the stick of Ephraim and the stick of Joseph uh, in, in one hand. Jesus talks about this as far as being gathered together in him. Um, we are we are one in Christ. There's a there's a unity in Christ. All of these things. Um, to, to say that, what, you know, the book of Acts is a template of how the kingdom is going to grow, how it's going to be reconstituted, how he unifies the kingdom uh, under him. Uh, 
Amos mentions this. Uh, uh, James says it as well, you know, as far as the Gentiles being added to the kingdom. And he quotes Amos as, uh, saying, you know, the tabernacle of David is, is being rebuilt. This is what was spoken of. So there is a reunification. It's not how we, you know, think it should look, but there is a re reunited Israel in Christ and the kingdom grows to the other, uttermost parts of the earth. And so there's a ruling and reigning aspect in, in I already mentioned it. I'm going to shut up and, and stop there. But I think that's what it is. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I am going to say the part that I don't like is uh, I do want to boss people around in the millennium. So <laughs> don't rain on my parade, man. I, I really want to boss people around in the millennium. And so um, maybe I'm reading that stuff into the text. But <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, Pastor Baker, uh, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on, I guess, kind of what my objection was with that passage. And, right. um, yes, let's go ahead. So I would parallel, like you did, Acts 3.21 and Matthew 19.28. And so I would use Acts 3.21, first of all, as a support for yeah, post-millennialism, and particularly the, 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 the distinctive of post-millennialism that Christ comes at the end or at the last day after um, his uh, his the millennial reign that is after his current reign so in acts 3:20 it says whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things and i take that when it says the times of restitution of all things as being the end and what we have at the end is you know, Christ coming back, heaven, the heavens receive him until the times of the restitution of all things, implying that he comes back at the time when all things are to be restored. When he comes back, we have him coming back to restore all things. And the first thing that occurs is the resurrection. And the resurrection occurs, uh, you know, for two reasons. First of all, obviously, we have the bodily resurrection of the saved, but also just just judgment. And that's why the dead are raised for judgment. I think you alluded to that earlier. God is basically cleaning all things up. He's doing away with death forever and for good. And that is the death of our bodies. We're resurrected to die no more. But also, the dead are raised, and then they are thrown into eternal destruction, and they will, of course, perish forever. And that's, and you know, I believe, obviously, that's not to be confused with annihilationism. I do believe that uh, that that punishment goes on for eternity in the lake of fire. But so he's cleaning everything up. I believe that this is a this is part and parcel with the rest restoration of all things. And then what happens is following judgment is the renewing of the world. And we we, we find uh, you know the the new heavens being consummated. We see uh, everything being made very good again. So that's what I would I believe that's what restitution is of all things is referring to. And I would differ with brother Scott here because I believe that's what the regeneration is referring to as well. So with acts three twenty one, it tells me that when he comes back, that the heavens must receive him. That's the same thing. He's going to reign until all enemies are made his footstool. When he comes back, he's going to judge the quick and the dead, the resurrection, the judgment of the quick and the dead. But that is also at the very same time, the restitution of all things. When I look at Matthew 19:28, I believe that that is a reference to the same event. So Matthew 19:28 as you quoted. And this used to be a very difficult passage for me. Um as I mentioned, I take a different interpretation than brother Scott did, but I feel more confident in this interpretation than I did in the past. And I believe it's because I had the premillennial view in mind. And I and and, and I think there's a, a a wrong assumption about this passage. So when you look in Matthew 19, verse 28, he says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now what's really important about this is that the phrase, the throne of his glory, that specific phrase, the throne of his glory, is also found only one other time in all of the Bible, and it's in Matthew, and it's in Matthew 25, 31. And Matthew 25, 31 is Jesus talking about his second coming. And I believe this also very clearly teaches a post postmillennialism. And it says in verse 31, Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And I only have verse 31 pulled up, so i got to open this up, but I'll go back in just a moment. But if you keep reading, it tells you in verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. This is clearly a general judgment, and it says that when Christ comes back, the general judgment is going to occur. At Christ's return, he's going to sit at that moment on the throne of his glory. If we compare that to Matthew 19, that's the regeneration. If we compare that to to Acts, I believe it was chapter 3, verse 21, that's the restitution of all things. And all throughout the book of Acts, again, it says that when he returns, it is to judge the quick and the dead. We see that here in Matthew uh, chapter number 25, like I said. So the throne of his glory, I believe, is that reference of when Christ comes back, which that return, here let me get back here to Matthew 19, is when he sits on the throne of his glory, and that is the regeneration. Now I believe the error that people make, that I used to make in, uh, with a premillennial perspective, is that I I would draw this event out as if it's like, you know, the re, like um, when it says, ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, that that's a reference to this long thousand year period. And I think the reason I did that is because I I assumed that thousand-year period. But I believe that the regeneration, the restitution of all things, in this case is a specific mention of his return. And when will they sit with him? Well, when does he sit in the throne of his glory? And what is that a reference to? When does judgment take place? When does he divide the sheep from the goats? And by the way, in the book of Ezekiel, I can't remember the chapter right now, But that reference to dividing the sheep from the goats is actually a reference to him dividing between believing Israel and unbelieving Israel. And I believe that when I believe this will come to pass and, you know, Pastor McMurtry, you know, maybe you will actually have some some some, be able to boss some people around. Mm -hmm. I think that this is a reference to us being the sheep and this event when Christ comes in the, the regeneration, he sits on the throne of his glory. He at that moment is judging the 12 tribes of Israel, separating the sheep from the goats. And I don't know if somebody can pull up that passage, if you guys don't mind, um, if, if you're aware of it, where in Ezekiel, that is actually, a, this is a quotation from there. He's going to separate unbelieving Israel from believing Israel. And this is a common theme all throughout the book of uh, Matthew, where the children of the kingdom are, are going to be taken out and cast into outer darkness, but the... Uh, but from the east and the west, the Gentiles are going to come in. And, um, you know, that's what I believe it is a reference to. That is the beginning of that regeneration. That's right when the restitution of all things is occurring. And we see Acts 3.21 referring to his second coming when he comes back as the restitution of all things. So I would take a slightly different perspective on that. Okay. Well, you know, uh, yeah, obviously with all this, there's— so much stuff. We probably should have had like a much more narrow focused conversation because all of us could say a lot more about our positions and, and to combat all these things. But I do want to go ahead and give Brother Clem, I guess, a chance to just kind of give a um, a pushback against post millennialism and uh, give you a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate that. So, um, and I, I mean, I don't, I don't completely disagree with, um, with Pastor Baker there. Um, when I look at Acts three nineteen, repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, I, I believe that that's talking about the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Spirit that would be poured out. In other words, he's telling them, repent, repent, and be converted, and receive the promise of of the Spirit. Um, it says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which we, uh, which before was preached unto you, when heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things is spoken of by the mouth of his holy provinces, uh, prophet since the world began. I do believe that last, that last little part, um, the restitution of all things is talking about that event as far as Jesus Christ coming back physically, bodily, raising the dead, bringing all under judgment um, and renewing the earth. I think we find something similar in Romans chapter 8. Uh, you know, that the creation groans, um, waiting for the adoption um, uh, of the sons of God. Uh, and, and so there's there's a weight that is upon the earth right now, which will be lifted at the second coming. 
Um, I, I absolutely believe that. And so some of some of this, absolutely, I agree. Another thing I could just add there, which, again, I think bolsters or helps support this idea that, that you know, um, when we think about the perfected kingdom and what that's going to look like, and, and are we going to rule and reign with him in the perfected kingdom? And what's that going to look like if there's, you know, who are we, again, that question again, who are we going to rule and reign over? Well, I don't think we're necessarily going to rule and reign over over people, but you know, who were who Adam and Eve supposed to rule over? They were the only ones there, and yet they're to, to exercise dominion, to rule and to reign. Revelation chapter 22, uh, and I think we would all agree this is talking about the perfected kingdom. Revelation 22 in verse number uh, 5 says, And there shall be no night there, and, and, uh, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And so there is a sense that in the perfected kingdom, we will be reigning forever and ever and ever. How does that all work? I don't I don't know. But there is that aspect in which we rule, we will rule and reign forever and ever and ever. My pushback would be that I think there is a sense in which I, I believe the kingdom has been inaugurated. It hasn't been consummated. But it has been inaugurated, and there is a sense in which we rule and reign with Christ now, and that looks like serving. Uh, Brother Baker mentioned that the idea that, um, you know, he mentioned, I think, in uh, Ezekiel there. There's lots of places, Isaiah, as well, as far as, um, you know, the, the gospel is going to, to, to go out to the nations, to the Gentiles, and the nations are going to bring their wealth into Jerusalem. Um, you know, something along those lines. Well, I think that's happening even now with the body of Christ, with with the church. Um, the, the, I mean, it's exactly how the prophets said it would play out in the book of Acts. Israel is reconstituted in Christ. They wait for the spirit who was poured out upon them. And then what happens next? Well, Samaria, uh, would, you know, which if anybody you know knows anything about the northern kingdom uh, of Israel, also called Samaria, they're added into the church, to the body of Christ. And then from there, it goes out to the Gentiles, to the nations. And so there's a sense in which the gospel is going out to the nations right now. Um, more and more I could say on that, um, I'll, I'll kind of keep that that brief. So I'm not, I, you know, I wouldn't exclude the idea that we're going to rule and reign in eternity future. We absolutely are. And Revelation 22 makes that abundantly clear. What does that look like? I I don't know, but it's it's going to be something that happens. And so um, I wouldn't, you know, completely disagree. But that inaugurated part that the rule, ruling and reigning now is, is definitely, I think, an aspect. And again, that regeneration tied to Titus uh, three five. That's not something future. I believe. I think that's happening now. So, all right. What do you think, Pastor Baker? Yeah, I agree um, with Brother Scott when he says that we're going to reign in eternity. I totally agree with that. Um, I guess where we would differ is the interpretation of Matthew chapter nineteen, and I, the throne of His glory. I tie with the restitution, the time of regeneration. He sits on the throne of His glory as a reference to him coming in and that is him coming to judge uh the quick and the dead at that time is the resurrection resurrection i believe he separates uh the sheep and the goat uh the sheep the the sheep and the goats and um that is a reference to israel those that are um wicked being cast out uh of the kingdom and then we enter the kingdom and i totally agree we reign for all eternity what does that exactly look like of course that's difficult as you mentioned there's going to be some speculation there um, I would also, one thing to kind of throw out there, I guess, as a supporting point to my interpretation that Matthew 19 is tied with Matthew 25 um, and that they will uh, judge the 12 tribes of Israel when Christ comes and it's uh, he's sitting on the throne of his glory, that in 1 Corinthians it tells the saints that, know you not that you shall judge angels. Now, obviously, I don't think that that's going to be a drawn-out period of time either. So again, just like the regeneration there doesn't have to refer to the entire time. It could just refer to the restitution of all things when Christ is coming back at that moment. Angels aren't going to be living on the earth. Nobody believes that. So when will the saints judge the angels? Well, I believe that they will judge the angels at the general judgment and resurrection in that he separates the sheep from the goats. And, uh, you know, we, we are the sheep. We are um, uh, the children of God. Christ is the king. And, you know, however that looks exactly, 
Um, that's when I believe that, that that points to, that that is the judgment, that that's when the angels are judged, um, and uh, they are judged um, by Christ, ultimately. Okay. Well, yeah, again, so when it comes to all these things, we could talk for hours, and the one thing I did want to do, and I'd like to do this in the next 20 minutes or so, I'd like to see if we can kind of do this fast, because... There, a lot of stuff was discussed. A lot, there's a lot of things we could all talk about, argue about. So I do want to like leave it up to audience questions. Hopefully, and I, I know this has helped me have a better understanding of the ah mill and the post mill position. So I guess for the audience, this is your chance to see what you still feel like you need to know. And here's something too I want to throw out there too, because being from the premillennial world and mainly being from the pre tribulation world. I have often heard the statement made that, you know, amillennialism and postmillennialism is heresy. Okay. So if anybody has a reason for why they believe these things are heresy that we can let these men respond to, then uh, I would like to do that. Now, so in, in reality, the only, um, the only reason I have heard these things are heresy. And I'll give you guys a chance if you want to briefly respond to this is because basically if you believe amillennialism or postmillennialism, uh, you are agreeing with Catholics and Calvinists. So what do you guys say about that? Catholic well, I, I guess I would marry too. Go ahead, Brother Scott. <laughs> you go ahead. We're going to keep the pattern yeah, or the order. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Catholics espouse the Trinity. You know, right. does that mean that we have to be against the Trinity or, you know, well, the Catholics, the Catholics, the Catholics have some things right. Um, that doesn't mean that that, you know, just because they have some things right doesn't mean they're legitimate. Um, just because they they, you know, as, I, I understand where people are coming from as far as the fourth century in particular and Augustine and how things really got twisted up as far as. Um, the incorporation of Greek philosophy and Platonism and, and the allegorization and all of that kind of stuff. And I would be against that, too. I would be opposed to that, too. Um, but uh, but that's not reason en enough just to reject um, amillennialism or postmillennialism just because just because the Catholics, you know, held to that. I, I think I think that's it's more of a straw man. I, you know, and t Brother Tyler has, a I think, a great answer. Um, you know, he shared with us, uh, with me um, when we were visiting, as far as, um, you know, the, the relationship of Israel and kind of what we're seeing today, even with modern day Israel in the correlation of, of Israel and, and premillennialism. And, uh, and Brother Tyler, I don't know if you want to, um, you know, speak to that. I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, particularly referring to how, um, why premillennialism existed in the early church right 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 and and yeah. why it's kind of have a resurgence today yeah yeah um i i could do it uh kind of quickly but yeah i believe that premillennialism it did exist in the early church so i mean we need to be honest about these things right and yeah. that's why it's called historical premillennialism if somebody claims that it existed all throughout church history that is just flat out not true so you can go to wikipedia and, and look up historical premillennialism and it'll tell you the the proponents of it in the church in in and it's the early church and the early church specifically refers to a certain time period and it gives you the names of all of the proponents okay so you can see that the reason why it's called the historical premillennial position it's not because it was the position that's held all throughout church history it's specifically held by those in the early church and the people that are named if you look at it are um polycarp i believe irenaeus uh, Justin Martyr. These are all very well-known figures in the early church. And the first three centuries, at least, held to a premillennial view. And I believe my personal opinion, and, and this would just be, of course, speculation, and it doesn't mean that it's wrong, and it doesn't mean that it's right necessarily, but I, I, it makes sense to me that the early church, just as we see the Apostle Paul um, still hanging on to that old covenant, and a lot of the things that have to do with the Old Covenant. And we see the we see um, Christians having the wrong perspective or the wrong view. And I would say, you know, a, a very uh, uh, Old Testament or, or a wrong, you know, Jewish view, let's say, just to be careful. Um, uh, a, 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 uh, a Judaism sort of perspective of uh, Christianity. 
I believe that that stuck with Christians for many years, and particularly um, following the destruction of the temple, what happened was it allowed Christianity to become Christianity, to become New Testament Christianity, I should say. And um, they were able to get away from the sacrifices. They were able to get away from the traditions of the Jews, which a lot of them had become corrupted. And we see this being kind of uh, uh, corrected and rebuked and reproved. And we see even the disciples having misconceptions repeatedly. And I think as Christianity grew, it developed and they got away from many of the misconceptions that came with uh, that you know, Judaism, and they were able to get away from the idea of the Jews. We see, again, it, there's this association with premillennialism and, and a physical kingdom, premillennialism, and it's the same idea that the Jews would hold today of a Messiah, uh, similar at least. Uh, and then we see in dispensational premillennialism, we see in both of them there is a pattern, and that is that a physical kingdom is going to reign from Jerusalem. And there's this hyper emphasis, I believe, on um, the same things that Judaism emphasizes, the same things that Christianity in the beginning had wrong, even the disciples. That's why I say Christianity even. And I think that it took time for them to kind of work the tradition. They, they lived in a certain time in a certain place, and they worked those things out over that period of time. And I believe that it that's why we saw the resurgence of it when um, you know with uh, Schofield and what was his emphasis? Israel, physical Israel. And what do we see? Premillennialism with it. And that's, you really have to have a premillennial view if you want to have an emphasis on physical Israel. You can't really bring them back into the picture unless you want to plug them into the book of Revelation and in times. Yep. Well, there was definitely a lot of problems the early church had. You can see that in the book of Acts, you know, with them trying to basically even hoping to get Israel saved and restored. And then it, the book of Acts concludes that, you know what, well spake Isaiah the prophet, you know, having eyes they see not, ears they hear not. And they, um, yeah, they're, so they're, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying there for sure. So, yeah, so again, on the questions, if, um, if you want to direct them at an individual, uh, that will help. Um, there was a lot of really good questions early on. Um, if you want to put them in again, that might help too, because finding them could be very difficult. But um, again, too, uh, I do. If somebody thinks these things are heresy and makes them heretics, I want to hear your reasons. And now is the chance to respond. Because the only thing I'm hearing from people is that Calvinists and Catholics agree with it. And I just think that's a stupid reason to call someone a heretic. And honestly, I have, I have not heard anything. I've heard things I would disagree with, but not anything heretical. I do not believe uh, these are like, I have not heard any separation issue things yet. And so um, I really think we need to get, uh, I want to give people a chance to uh, respond to that if you think that's there. But uh, one question uh, I'll ask, and it's not directed at anybody uh, individually, but I think this is a good question. But is the kingdom equal uh, to the millennium? And if it is, Jesus said, then that the millennium was taken from Israel and given to the church. You know, please explain. And, and it does seem that um, those terms are kind of used similarly. So what, what would uh, we'll let you go first, Pastor Baker. What do you think about that question? So I would say that the millennium refers to the time period uh, uh, following the inauguration of the new covenant kingdom. Now, obviously, we have um, Christ referring to the kingdom of God is at hand. So there's obviously uh, a a way in which the kingdom had not come. He's saying it's coming, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what the reference is. I think it's a reference to Christ. You know his his resurrection, and ultimately, really, it's the 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 linchpin is him ascending and seated at the right hand, and that is the inauguration of the new covenant kingdom. That's what I would say. And I and um, I don't know if I can throw this out there uh, real quick, but I saw I think this relates. I saw somebody mention the the binding of Satan in Revelation twenty. I think that's also a, a, another very very good reference do you mind if i just real real quickly because i think yeah that, and that's been uh that's been asked earlier too i think that's another important question uh the binding of satan what is that 
yeah, so I, I, so if I take, as I said earlier, all of the explicit, what I find to be the explicit scriptures and the timeline that all of the Bible gives me, and then I overlay that with Revelation chapter number 20, understanding with my hermeneutic that the book of Revelation is symbolic. And I look around in scripture to see what the Bible says about the binding of Satan or the destruction of Satan. I think the Bible is categorically clear. For example, in Hebrews chapter number two, it says that through death, Jesus destroyed him who had the power of death. Now, it's in past tense, had, and it says he's destroyed already. Um, Christ says, before he, right before he goes to the cross, the time of, of the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, he said that the time has come that the prince of this world is going to be cast out. Um, and there's other passages that speak to that as well. Jesus speaks that at his first coming, he came to bind the strong man. And he's re he's referencing the kingdom of God coming. If I connect that with all of the prophecies in the Old Testament, like Daniel, that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is coming at the time of the first advent, and you know, we see the the, the kingdoms of the world being destroyed at that very time, Satan being the prince of this world, having the power of this world. That makes perfect sense. He's cast out at the first advent. Christ is now reigning. He's been destroyed. And I understand that the book of Revelation has symbolism in it. He's bound, and, and, and in what respect is he bound? He's bound um, with respect to deceiving the nations. Well, what is the big difference at the time when Christ ascends to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father? He now reigns over all the earth. He's the king of kings, which specifically means he reigns over all nations. And what changes? Now... They go out and they preach the gospel to every creature. Now they go out and they convert the nations. And this is the time, I believe, of you know what we would think of as the messianic reign. I think that's a perfect way to refer to it, as Brother Scott called it earlier. And the nations are converted during this time period. And this is why the apostles say that uh, when speaking of the Gentiles, that in the time past, you know, God winked at um you know, the sins of the nations and let them go their own way, if you will. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Something has changed. And I believe that that's what it is. Christ now reigns. He sends forth his his uh, disciples into all nations to convert all nations. And uh, Satan is bound with respect to deceiving the nations. That's the biggest difference of the new covenant in Christ's current reign, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Clem, what, what are your thoughts on on both those things, the the millennium and the kingdom question, and then also the binding of Satan. Yeah, the uh, you know on, on the on the kingdom question, um, the the thing that kind of ir you know that, that really bugged me um, when I was really kind of coming out of dispensationalism was this notion that that Jesus isn't reigning. Um, or he's not reigning in any real sense anyway, you know, that, that Satan's in control of this world. And I, I don't know what Jesus is doing, but he's not he's not ruling and reigning when we have clear scriptures, clear references where Jesus has all authority in heaven and in earth. And I think um, just his, you know, not only does the Bible testify that Jesus is ruling and reigning, we, there's a lot of verses that we could point to. Um, but history, I, I believe uh, early church history also points to the fact that that's exactly what the the the, the first believers, the early church believed. Um, it, it, I'll, I'll share this little anecdote. Um, you know, back back in the first and second century, the, the the idea was that the golden age had come and that Rome had brought the golden age. Uh, they called it the Pax Romana, Roman peace. And and how did how did Rome bring peace? How did Caesar bring peace? by killing other people, you know, by having the bigger stick, you know, you get out of line, we're going to beat you to death. And there, see, we've created peace. And so the, the saying was, is that Caesar is the earth's true Lord. And, you know, we, we all know those stories about how they were to take a, a pinch of incense and declare Caesar as Lord and all that kind of stuff. The early Christians in the first and second century didn't do that. In fact, they said something remarkable. They said that Jesus is the earth's true Lord. Now, that may not mean anything to us, but that is a highly political statement. They are saying that Jesus is the king of the earth. That's what they're saying. And they were, they were, they were you know, essentially t telling Rome uh, to shove it. And they were willing to die for that message, to give up their lives for the proclamation that Jesus is the Lord 
of the earth, that Jesus is the one who brings real peace, not by killing his enemies, but by dying for them, that he's the Prince of Peace. And so I think early church uh, history verifies this out that, that, that the kingdom, um, that they had a sense of what the kingdom of God was and that Jesus is ruling and reigning. So uh, one last point to this, um, you know, I, and I wrote this down, you know, just kind of trying to keep my thoughts together. And I, I wrote down here, so if the kingdom of God is already inaugurated and Jesus is reigning as king, he is the earth's true Lord, and we are living in the messianic era under the sovereign rule of King Jesus, then why shouldn't this be called the millennial reign? What, if anything, distinguishes his reign in the future, in a future thousand years from that of right now, such that a future time should carry the special designation of the millennium and not right now. And the only thing that I can uh, really put my finger on as far as kind of the main thing, as far as premillennialism really kind of hangs its hat on, is this idea that a reconstituted Israel of some sort. Now, I know, I know, uh, Brother uh, uh, Tommy, you would disagree um, as far as, you know, ethnic Israel being a future Israel and all that kind of stuff. You have the right idea of Israel, Israel being the people of God in the Messiah. But there's still this notion that that we have to have there, you know, we have to have a true Israel that mediates God's blessings to the nations in a future millennium. And I would argue that that's happening right now. Um, that the blessings of God are being mediated to the nations through the true Israel, that is the church. Uh, and so if it's happening right now, why, why do we have to why do we have to do that over again in, in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in a, a thousand more years? So that's kind of one of those things that is, is, a, is a bit of a hang up for me. As far as the, um, you know, the, the Satan being bound. Uh, you know, that's a that's a heavy one to get into. I'll just say this, just to kind of piggy uh, jump, you know, piggyback off of Brother Tyler here. Um, just give a couple of verse, uh, verses of scripture. We obviously, I think we would all agree that Satan is the little G God of this world. But there is also a sense in which Satan is a defeated foe. And Jesus says this specifically in, in John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. He says, now is the judgment of this world now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up um, from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And so the, the cross, you know, the cross is the is the arena in which Jesus duped it out with Satan, if you will. He said a little bit later on in, in John chapter 16, uh, he when he was talking about the spirit who he was going to send. And he says that the spirit is going to reprove the world of three things, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me, Jesus says. Uh, of of uh, righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I, I mean, there's, there's no mistaking it. He's making it known that the prince of the world is, in fact, judged. And so when we look at that, um, you know, that little story about uh, Jesus casting out uh, demons and the Pharisees accusing him, saying, well, you're casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus makes that uh, that little statement. He says, if, if I cast out devils with the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Um, and so there is the sense in which um, there's a there's a foreboding of Satan and his kingdom in the Gospels that Jesus has come, that Jesus is the strong uh, strong man or. Jesus is stronger than the strong man. He's going to bind the strong man, strong man, and he's spoiling his goods. And I believe that's what's happening now. Uh, the, I think the millennial reign is constituted as this time of spiritual warfare. Satan's kingdoms warring against the kingdom of God. Um, the kingdom of God of the age to come has invaded this present wicked age and is spoiling sa Satan's kingdom, such that in Colossians 1.13, when believers are saved, they are. Uh, uh, Paul says that they are, um, uh, delivered from the powers of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. So we see this kingdom growing, but Satan's kingdom is fighting back. Um, Satan's kingdom is powerful, but Satan's kingdom only has one, one weapon really that it can use to be effective, and it's death. And who defeated death? Well, Jesus did. Um, you know, and so so we're on the winning side of, of all of this. And even if the kingdoms of this world kill us, um, and Satan tries to take us out. Every, every time he kills a saint, that's that's part of Satan's defeat because we are going to rise from the grave. We're going to get the last word through Jesus Christ 
and the resurrection. And so, um, so I think there's a sense in which Satan is defeated. I won't say any more than that. There's a lot more that I can say, but, but we must get this idea that Satan is a defeated foe. Um, he's, he's on, uh, he's, he's waiting until the final um, judgment is carried out. And he knows there's a short time, um, which is why he's very, very wrathful at the moment. But he is a defeated foe. And the cross was the place of that victory. Okay. Brother Tommy, uh, can I just kind of throw a qualification on my statement and just yeah. say, I preached a sermon on you know, the binding of Satan, and I, I said that exact uh, uh, same thing. And that is that um, I believe that the decisive blow was delivered to Satan on the cross, right? That he's been destroyed and his power has been taken away in that sense. Um, but of course, uh, what I believe about the kingdom is that it it grows. So I would agree with Brother Scott in that same uh, line of things. Okay, yeah, and I guess my response to the kingdom being equal to the millennium, well, I, yeah, obviously the mo term millennium is not in the Bible. That's just what we refer to because you know we believe the or I believe that the timeline of that kingdom will be a thousand years. I think the when Jesus talked about the kingdom being taken from Israel. I think one of the key things about that is is um, in the in that fig tree that had no fruit because there was no fruit on it. Jesus cursed it and it died. And it's in that same set of stories where we see these parables about the kingdom being taken from Israel, which again I believe is the purpose of what we've been doing as a church for the last two thousand years. We have been doing the job under the new covenant that Israel failed to do under the old covenant. And I believe that Christ, um, he, while he presented that kingdom to Israel, he was, you know, legally doing all the things he was supposed to do. It was not able to come because of the fact that Israel was not ready. There was no fruit. Uh, they weren't clean and sanctified as a people. And so I believe, I believe that's going to happen again. It's going to be presented again at Christ's next coming and just like at the first triumphal entry they're waving palm branches in revelation 7 where i believe the rapture is what do we see we got the palm branches again it's going to be good next time thanks to jesus christ and then as far as the binding of satan i think we i think people get confused in a lot of the references to defeating satan what i the way i would explain it briefly is that at christ's first coming in the first century Jesus displayed his dominance over Satan. He displayed his dominance over things like death, but he did not he did not end them. He did not destroy those things. Satan was not destroyed um, or um, but he was uh, he was definitely defeated in that sense. And so we're still waiting for those things that take place and we have every reason to believe, the things that are promised because of what Jesus displayed at his first coming. And so as far as the binding of Satan, uh, I, I don't believe that Satan is bound right now because he's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. To me, him being put in a bottomless pit, I think that renders him helpless on, on this earth. And I guess I would take that very literal uh, where he's bound in that pit. And obviously there's still going to be some problems on the earth because we can't blame Satan for all our problems. You know, we have sin uh, and the flesh. And in the millennium, you will have a people who still have flesh and sin, but they will also be under righteous judgment because a kingdom will have arisen that meets, that uh, has all the things Jesus was looking for at his first coming and, and didn't find. And that will be this kingdom of people from every nation and kindred and tongue. Uh, that would be the saved believers. So that's how I see those things. And I, I would look at, look at those things. And so, um, hey, can I, I, can yeah, I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've been, you've been such a great host. And so I was, um, I, I going to throw this out there, just kind of see what you think. So, you, you would agree, just kind of piggybacking off of what you said, that under the old covenant, Israel was given, a, a, if I could say it this way, a particular vocation. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can categorize this, and, and hopefully you'll agree with it, that the vocation of Israel was to was to be a light to the nations, to mediate God's blessings to the nations. Mm -hmm. right? And you would agree with that? All right. right. And you, you would agree that, that now 
um, that that is being fulfilled in Christ today. That that the church is is um, is now fulfilling Israel's vocation and being a light to the nations. Yes. Right. So. So what more needs to be done in a future millennium? If that's going on today, um, I, I guess where where would you where would you fall on that? Why does that need to happen in a future millennium too? Right, because I do believe that God wants to, um, He wants that righteous nation. Like te so, for Israel, for example, uh, we see in a lot of the prophecies that were fulfilled at Christ's first coming. We also see the defeating of their enemies. We see them inheriting the earth. We see them, you know, they they were going to rule and do all of these things. And uh, I I do I believe uh, God is wanting to give us. Uh, you know, and give Christ the heathen for his inheritance, the other most part of the earth. So I do, I believe God has wanted there to be a kingdom on this earth. He's wanted there to be a nation that was going to rule and, and righteousness. And so um, I, uh, that's why, why I believe there's still, I guess you could say governmental things that need to take place. Um, there's so many wonderful promises that God gave to the nation of Israel that if they would do these things, there was all these wonderful blessings that would come. And, and just none of those things ever took place because they were just so sinful. And I think I think there's going to be many places in the millennium, and I'm going into opinion a little bit, where I think there's going to be a lot of nations that are going to be just wonderful places that do receive many great blessings. And I'm talking that have regular mortal people in them where there's not going to be a barren woman among them. They're, the pestilence isn't going to come nigh them and all these different things. I, I think that's going to happen in some places where I think there's going to be some places where, um, you know, they didn't show up for the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's not going to be any rain, you know. So uh, I just think there's a lot of stuff that was offered that never played out in the Old Testament. And I believe those things are still yet to be fulfilled. Brother Tommy, can I dogpile on you real quick? Uh, go for it. I'll, I'll there take we it. go. So I would, I would, um, I would say that 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 his question is perfect, and I think the reason why Scott, brother Scott, recognizes that, and 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 that is, you know, I had that prepared as well, and I recognize it also, is because we both came formally from a very similar position that you had, and we both realized that I had this idea of let's call it dual fulfillment of a lot of these things. But then I just I realized that these things ha have already been fulfilled in Christ and that, for example, I think I think um, Christ, so you quoted um, uh, that Christ is going to have the heathen for his inheritance. Right. But Christ right now reigns over all heaven and all earth. I, it, it is his inheritance. And not only that, we're going to be kings and priests, but aren't we kings and priests right now? Mm. And. And, and furthermore, I think that post-millennialism or maybe even the view like our, our you know, Brother Scott's view is and, and mine are so close because I do take, like I said, the, the, the apostasy approach. And you never know just what the converting the nations are going to look like. So I could even include his view into this. I think that the post-mill position really is that culmination of Abraham's blessings to all nations. And that goes out in the new covenant. And that is the gospel going forth into all these nations. And I think that we see effects of it. I think the gospel, when it goes into a society and we can look around and he appealed to history earlier, we can look around and see these things. And the Western nations are what they are, not because it's the white man, but because of Christianity and it has nothing to do with the people. And when, and Christianity has existed in many other cultures and societies and done very similar things. And I believe that that is the blessings of Abraham going out into the nations. I think that through Christ, all of those things truly were fulfilled. They may look a little differently than you thought that, you know, then, then I'll say from my perspective, than I thought that they would from a premillennial pre perspective, but they are truly fulfilled in Christ. And he has the heathen as his inheritance today because he has all things. We are kings and priests today. And all of those things would be what we would look forward to in like a pre-millennial view of like a physical kingdom that takes place for those thousands of years or for those thousand years. But I would also say that I do believe in a physical kingdom. Um, 
not only now is there is there a spiritual and, and an aspect of the physical, as he said, uh, we don't go forth with a sword and we're not at one organized you know nation, you know, or a nation made up of all people and 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 tongues and kindreds. But I would also say, in addition to that, there will be the time when Christ comes and sits in the throne of His glory, and uh, as He says, we all also you know would refer to this as. Uh, being that the eternal state is also being a physical kingdom. So I think that I have that application as well. What do we need that that additional thousand year period? If we have the physical kingdom, then if we can make that application in all these things now, what, you know, kind of just, as I said, yeah, well, I think that, right. So again, I think what we need is on this earth, you know, as Christians, we have been treated poorly historically and i do think that um it, I, you know it's my opinion and my belief that um you know the reward we receive is going to be you know fulfilled in a very earthly way where we are going to make a comeback and we are going to you know rule on an earth like I said better than this you know in a millennial style earth like we would uh like we would explain it but yet yeah, while we can see all these things have been fulfilled in Christ, I do believe there's something he wants to do for us. And the motivation in the scriptures, I mean, it did seem to be, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of a carnal motivation. You know, when you see in Hebrews 11 that others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might you know, obtain a better resurrection. You know, people realized, hey, I'm going to come back. And so you know, all the suffering, the doing without, the being poor on this earth, uh, I just really feel like there's going to be a time where we will get to experience those riches, uh, receive that honor, that authority, all the things that we have walked away from on this earth serving Christ, God's going to give those things back. And these things that we've walked away from, they have, they've, they've been carnal things. They've been earthly things material things and i believe that um you know that they're what we're going to receive as a result are going to be earthly and material things that i guess you know looks a lot like what is typically taught in the premillennial world about the millennial kingdom so maybe i'm so maybe i'm just still seeing something that's not there but that's how i would look at it and i just feel it needs to be fulfilled but you guys are right Many things that Israel, uh, you know, or that were fulfilled even in the first century, it wasn't like Israel thought it was going to be. That could still be the case with us where we don't have a proper understanding of how something is going to play out. So, but man, there were a lot of good questions, especially earlier, but uh, we went longer than I wanted to for sure. And so, uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of these. Uh, I do want to shut this down. It's getting late, but um, I just want to, uh, I'll give you guys a chance to kind of just give some final words on this. Nobody left uh, any good reasons for why you guys are heretics. Uh, we'll probably have to hear about that later uh, from people who will go unopposed and, um, and we'll beat the snot out of the straw men and all that kind of stuff. But um you know, Brother Clem, what are your uh, final words that you would like to give to the audience on this subject? Yeah, well, um, well, thanks, uh, brother, for doing this. This is this has been fun, and it's been good to to actually get people together um, to talk about the millennium in in this way. Um, my my final thoughts, really, on the subject, particularly those um, I totally get, especially in the IFB world, like. There's no one that's post millennial. There's no one that's that's amillennial. I mean, as far as I know, Tyler and I might be it. Like that's that's there's just no one else. Um, so we're kind of on a really small island, and I I know that it's easy to just go along with tradition and go go along with things they've they've always been. Um, it I'll say this: it isn't without a a, a lot of thought and struggle and wrestling through the scriptures that one comes to, to a position such as this, particularly if you come from a dispensational background. Um, that, that doesn't just happen, I can assure you. Um, I, I'm not a Catholic. In fact, I've got a Catholic guy in my area who hates my guts. He's trying to convert me, and, and 
Uh, he he wants to bring back the Inquisition, and he'd probably have me, you know, drawn and quartered if mm-hmm. if we were in those days. I'm I'm not a Calvinist. Um, I'm the furthest thing from it. And I've got Calvinist people who hate my gut. So it's not because of Catholicism or the influence of of um, you know Calvinism or anything like that that I that I've arrived to my position. It is strictly because I've, I've looking at the scriptures, wrestling through these things, and in particular, you know, some of those issues about the kingdom of God. Like, there's no denying that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated, brother Tommy. You mentioned earlier, as far as you know, Christ conquering the nations, and I believe that there's a sense, there's a sense in which I agree with Tyler that the that he, you know, Christ has done that. Sort of. I think that's maybe where we would disagree a little bit more. I think Christ is is doing that right now. Conquering now and still to conquer. There's an old Fanny Fanny Crosby song that mentions that. So Christ is conquering the nations now, but he's not doing it the way that we typically think it should happen. He's not doing it with a sword and a shield. He's doing it through the gospel. That's how he's conquering the nations. I like to tell people, Jesus conquered me. I was a a rebel and I was an enemy. Um, And how did he conquer me? He conquered me with his love. And the strange thing is that that not only did he conquer me, but but I died because I died with Christ, but I was, I'm also risen with Christ. And so there is a sense that I absolutely am a defeated foe. Um, and, and now I'm on his side. Now I'm announcing his kingdom. Now I'm spreading that message to to the nations. Um, and so that is happening today where Jesus is conquering now and, and still to conquer. All that to say, the things that we find in the in the Old Testament, um, you know, just very, very simply, the the expectations that the Jews were were right, the anticipations of how it would come to pass, were wrong. But the expectation that God would regather His people and then pour out His Spirit upon His people, and that the the um, and that His 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 nation would then influence the world and and uh, mediate God's blessings to the world, like like all of that's happening today. That's happening. That's happening now. Um, and, a, and a lot of those um, things, as far as the, the things that I just said, even about like pouring out the spirit and mediating God's blessings to the nations. If you look in the Old Testament, though, a lot of those things are found in passages that we would rightly call millennial passages. We say, well, that's going to happen in millennium, but it's happening now. The nations are now streaming into Zion today. What is Zion? Well, it's not a physical Jerusalem. Um, it is a spiritual. It's a heavenly Jerusalem. And that is happening today. So. Um, for for those who think that we're still just absolutely crazy, and maybe you're going to call us heretics anyway, and and, and that's that's okay. Um, I'm not coming to this because of some tradition. In fact, if I wanted to, if I was going to take a traditional stance on something, it would be with premillennialism. I was I I have come to the position where I am because I've struggled through the scriptures, and there are there are inconsistencies with premillennialism that I cannot, um, you know, in my right mind reconcile and i see more and more things fulfilled as far as uh, the relationship from the old testament to the new testament and th- that doesn't mean there's still not problems that doesn't mean that there are uh weaknesses with amillennialism or post millennialism there is there's weaknesses with every single position but when i take um the, the you know the, the uh collective evidence from the entire bible and we're you know going back to like general resurrection and you know the final judgment and even the new creation and how the curse is going to be lifted from the earth a, a thousand years a future thousand years doesn't that puzzle piece, piece doesn't fit anywhere and so that's that's the difficulty that i have so again tommy thank you i uh, really appreciate this uh, very generous and um uh, you're one of a kind man thanks for doing this all right, Pastor Baker, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. I appreciate you, Pastor Tommy, for having us on. I appreciate this, the spirit of the spirit of prophecy um, in that uh, you are a true seeker, and you, you come at this thing especially in being uh, an independent Baptist, and I grew up an independent Baptist. You come at this from a very different perspective. It's very rare, and um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you having us on. And yeah, I, I agree. I think that people so quickly are they're looking for reasons to call people heretics. We don't even really know 
oftentimes what we mean by heretic. It's just that you 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 believe something different that I don't believe that makes me uncomfortable or whatever it may be. And there's not a real clear definition to what people mean by what is heresy oftentimes or what, you know, somebody is when they're a heretic. And I think, you know, um, uh, as Brother Scott said, um, I didn't come to my position um, out of, uh, you know, wanting to be, you know, and it has nothing to do with Catholicism or Calvinism or anything like that. I'll be honest with you. I think my position came from covenant theology, and I kind of referenced that earlier. I think that's the the, the natural, logical. I think that that's the view, the biblical position that's taught. I think it flows there. I think it is the replacement of the old covenant with the new covenant. I think that's where it will lead you is to an a mill, post mill view, and, and 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 different varieties of it. And when we get there. We're going to still disagree on some of the specifics um, because all, as he pointed out, all we're, you know, we're, we are errant. We have problems and, and we're never going to have a perfect understanding. So we're going to, we're going to find things that we disagree about still. Um, Even when we, you know, follow covenant theology to where I believe it ultimately leads. And that would be a view of, of amillennialism or postmillennialism. And I just want to say again that I, I actually don't disagree with, and Brother Scott thought that I would, but I don't disagree with his view that, um, you know, that the all of the enemies have not been defeated or that, you know, Satan is not still being defeated now. I believe that that is a process still. I believe the decisive blow was dealt on the cross, but that it's a process. And, and I believe that nation after nation is is conquered during this period of time that we live in that is the time of christ's reign and i you know new nations pop up and then ultimately the gospel goes in and it's not like he said by sword and shield they are won by a sword but it's the the sword that proceeds out of his mouth and it's the word of god and specifically it's us wielding it and that is his hands and his feet going forth into these nations and we are bringing the blessing of abraham with us and we don't we don't conquer them physically and wanting to kill them, but we conquer them in bringing the message of love, which is the gospel to these nations. And that's what conquers. That's what conquered. Think of the apostle Paul, you know, those words that he echoes that are clearly intimate and personal in Galatians. And he, he says, who loved me and gave himself for me. He was an enemy of the cross in some sense, but what conquered him was the love of Christ and was the gospel. And I think that that is, that's still happening today. I think that that is the fulfillment of covenant theology. That's why I believe it. And and to be honest, I slowly work to this position. Anybody who knows um, my uh, kind of uh, you know, development and process to this, I held to a view of general judgment probably five, six years, probably maybe seven years ago. I, I held to a view of Jerusalem being Babylon for about almost, almost 11 years now. And I believe that these things point to that and it was a it was just a slow process that um uh, you know one piece of the puzzle and i think uh brother scott did a very good job of just um, uh, explaining that it, you know, when you when you put it all together you take the clearest scripture and then you we we approach the book of revelation and we see our timeline i think that reign of christ fits right now and that is between the first coming and the second coming and I think we go forth, and and we, as his hands and his feet, we as the body of Christ, bring the gospel into all the nations and convert the nations, and they flow into Zion, and his law goes forth from sea to sea, and the nations uh, kneel to Christ, and that is him making his enemies his footstool. And if you don't mind, I think I, I just want to emphasize that passage. That passage, I believe, is the is the pivotal passage in the whole conversation. And that is that the time period when Christ's enemies are made his footstool, that occurs while Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in David's throne. And I think that's a real hard passage to get around, especially in the context of 1 Corinthians 15. But that's the process that Brother Scott referred to. That process is nation after nation uh, converting. That's the nations being converted. And uh, it happens while Christ is seated at the right hand of the of God. So All thank right. you, Brother Scott. I really appreciate it. Well, I definitely appreciate you guys coming on here. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I apologize to the I, I didn't get to more questions. 
Uh, I am not, I, I've not done as many of these as Brother Donnie, and so I didn't do a good job in uh, estimating how much time certain things would take. But it did do what I wanted to do. This wasn't supposed to be a, so much a debate as it was an opportunity to help people understand what the different positions are, you know, with, um, and um, I thought it would be interesting just hearing a discussion between three people uh, talking about it like gentlemen. And I learned a lot uh, about their positions tonight. There were some things that I thought they believed, especially on postmillennialism, that wasn't the case. And I think these discussions are important because everybody needs to admit prophecy is hard. It's difficult. Things like the millennium, these are challenging things. And it is not profitable when we are all just water boys for a specific camp and a specific doctrine. And when we are holding on to a position just because of political purposes. And that's where most people are at. And they reveal themselves by the fact that, one, they are ignorant often of other people's positions. And they reveal their insecurity by just quickly attaching nasty labels calling people heretics or Catholics and Calvinists or whatever. I just think that is unprofitable and there's nothing to be gained from that. And, um, and so I think there's something to be said. I, you know, as somebody who's been on the receiving end of a lot of nasty criticism and who has been accused of a lot of things that, you know, are not true things. I don't believe. I just believe in being fair to people and I believe in giving an actual biblical reason for why something is heresy. And I I can't give you a biblical reason for why an amillennial or postmillennial position is heresy. I can't give you a biblical reason for why we would divide over that. Uh, but I've always been told it's heresy. But I was also told pre-trib was true. So um, this is how we do things. And if I lose my IFB card for that, well, guess what? It's independent, so you can't take my IFB card. So go, what do you think about that? But anyway, I enjoy these things. That's why I do it, and I get a lot from it, and I do appreciate my Brother Clem, Brother Baker, for coming on the program. I think it was good, and I hope the audience enjoyed it. Make sure you like it, spread it around, and uh, subscribe. Do all those good things, and I guarantee you this will be another podcast that everyone will be talking about because the spirit of prophecy is the podcast that everyone is talking about. So thank you all for watching this. God bless you. And we will see you all next time.